Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the PVUSD Wednesday, March 28th board meeting. Uh, we do have a quorum here, soon to be five, with Mr. Yehiro walking up. Um, are there any speakers to closed session items? No cards have come in. We have Mr. Francisco Rodriguez. Thank you, Francisco Rodriguez, uh, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, your proposal, a receipt of your proposal on uh, Wednesday afternoon. Um, we were uh, very surprised at the way the uh, proposal was delivered and even more surprised at the negotiations update a few hours later. Um, we, you know, what's surprising about it is that left uh, the update left out some very important um, details that uh, you, you're running a little late, I know, so you probably want to go to your uh, session. I won't go into them now, um, but it did uh, leave out some very important details to our members. Um, I, I do want to let you know that uh, as we speak, uh, we're going we're gonna to be sending some uh, dates for negotiations to discuss this proposal. Uh, we have also submitted uh, last week and this week uh, a couple requests for information because um, at, at first glance, the way we see it, uh, it appears to be a cut in total compensation on the third year out. Um, so there's a 1% for 1617, 1% for, well, 2% minus half a year equals 1% for 1718. And then um, some uh, cost shifting uh, from our benefit side of compensation to the salary side. Um, so we'd like to see the numbers. And we will, of course, uh, make a counter to you like we always do. Uh, well before uh, four and a half months, which is how long you took to give us your first compensation proposal. Um, so um, be sure that we will be ready when uh, the negotiations uh, date comes up. Thank you. Any other speakers? Francisco, could you do us a favor and fill out a card so we, we just have that there on, on the back, yeah. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other speakers, we um, will adjourn to closed session where we will be uh, discussing expulsions, certificated and classified public employee appointments, employment appointments and employments, um, public employee discipline dismissals, releases and leaves, negotiations, updates, claims for damages, anticipated litigation, and that's it. Thank you. We'll return at 7 o'clock. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out to uh, the PVUSD March 28th board meeting. Um, we're going to start with our Pledge of Allegiance, and I will ask Trustee Acosta, do you mind leading us? The flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you again for coming out and joining us for tonight. Um, there um, are a couple things I just wanted, wanted to let the audience know. If you'd like to um, speak to an agenda item, um, there are blue and yellow cards in the foyer. When you walk in the door, blue is in Spanish, um, ye yellow is in English. And we did get um, several that have no item number on them. We need the agenda item number on here so we know when to call your name. And Eva. Um, recibimos estas tarjetitas que um, indican que alguien quiere hablar a al, al, al la mesa, pero no pusieron el número de la agenda y ocupamos eso para poder llamarles cuando les, les eh, sea su turno. Así que si usted llena una de estas hojas, necesita venir a recogerlas para poner el, el número, por favor. Okay, and for those who would like um, translation services, um, we do have a translator over here. You can um, approach this office right here, and you can get a headset, and the meeting will be translated for you. 
La señora Virginia tiene um, los, los aparatos para traducción y si ocupan um, traducción pueden ir con ella y, y les otorga una, un aparato. Okay, so it looks like we have uh, some people who are going to get translation services, so I'm just going to wait for a moment while they get set up because I don't want them to miss the next part. The photo, see you have the photo. Okay. All right. Thanks for your patience. Um, so I wanted to um, recognize somebody who um, we lost just recently, and this is somebody who is um, very important to education. Um, Linda Brown um, was a student. Um, I, well, I'm, I'm going to read about the first paragraph or so from her obituary. Linda Brown, whose father objected when she was not allowed to attend an all-white school in her neighborhood, and who th thus came to symbolize one of the most transformative court proceedings in American history, the school, school desegregation case Brown versus Board of Education passed away on Sunday in Topeka, Kansas. She was 75. Her death was confirmed on Monday by a spokesman for the Peaceful Rest Funeral Chapel in Topeka, and is handling her case. It is Miss Brown's father, Oliver, whose name is attached to the famous case, although the suit that ended up in the United States Supreme Court actually represented a number of families in several states. And we all know that that really was a landmark and historic case that um, shaped schools across the nation uh, from then moving forward. And so I just wanted to recognize um, Linda Brown and her father for um, really starting uh, or ending what was um, something that is, was not an equitable situation. I believe the Supreme Court, um, a quote from that case said that they, uh, they did recognize that separate is not, what was the word you gave me, is not inherently equal. So um, I just wanted to bring your um, attention to the passing of um, a hero, really, in American education. Thank you. Okay, and next is superintendent comments. So last Friday, I had a group of students from Rio Led Mar spend a day in the life of a superintendent with me. So together we visited adult education classrooms um, at the district office and visited various departments throughout the district office. They received a balloon and a water bottle from adult education. They walked in the, they visited the walk-in refrigerators and freezers and received a plush toy from food services. They had a great time and I really appreciate all the staff's extra effort to make them feel welcome. 
So, el viernes pasado, un grupo de estudiantes de Río del Mar pasaron un día en la vida del superintendente conmigo. Juntos visitamos los salones de educación para los adultos en la oficina del distrito y visitamos varios departamentos de las oficinas del distrito. Los estudiantes recibieron un globo y una botella de agua por parte de educación para adultos. Visitaron los refris y congeladores y recibieron un peluche, un peluche de parte del departamento de comida. La pasaron muy bien y agradecemos el refuerzo extra del personal. So we have our spring break coming up starting on Friday. So I hope that everyone takes time to be with their family and friends. I encourage the students in grades preschool through third grade to still spend time on the Paso a Paso Creciendo Juntos Footsteps to Brilliance app. We will announce our three winners of the donated Chromebooks, which are our super users of the program when we come back from break. So keep up that learning. So, tendremos nuestras vacaciones de primavera comenzando este viernes. Espero que todos se tomen el tiempo para estar con familia y amigos. Animo a los estudiantes de grados de preescolar a tercer grado a que sigan usando la aplicación de Paso a Paso Creciendo Juntos, Footsteps to Brilliance. Vamos a anunciar a nuestros tres ganadores de los Chromebooks donados, que son nuestros super us usuarios del programa cuando volveremos del descanso. So, siguen aprendiendo. Gracias. Okay, three, um, item 3.5 is comments from the board um, reports on standing. Oh, 3.4, I'm so sorry. Student recognition, how could I pass that up? This is our favorite. Um, so we are, um, we're recognized recognizing two students of the year this evening and we're going to start with um, McQuitty Elementary School Amira Lopez please come up with all of your family all of your support everybody come up with her and gather around Good evening, President DeRose, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here with Amira Bautista and her family, her father Javier, Danielle, her brother, and her little sister Arlene. Uh, I want to pass the mic over to Ms. Chappelle, her wonderful teacher of the last two years, to have, make some comments about Amira. Good evening. Um, as Mr. Hiltz just stated that I've been I was fortunate enough to be Amira's fourth grade teacher and then loop up to fifth grade with her and in that time I got to watch her really grow as a student um, and share her passion of reading with me where she she'll find an author that she likes and stick with that author until she's read every book and was actually wrote letters to uh, Bad Kitty's author <laughs> last year. But she's just an amazing person. She's always on task in class. She works really hard, not only for herself, but to help her peers succeed also. She's a very encouraging person and a wonderful problem solver, which is why we chose her as our to honor this year. OK. Yeah, do you want to speak? Um, thank you for bringing me here. It's been an honor, and I'd like to thank Ms. Chappelle, too, and Mr. Hiltz. Congratulations. <laughs> Hold on just a second. We have something for you here. If you'd like to um, move over here, we can get a photograph that, and we can share that with you.
congratulations. Keep up the good work. I think you have a brother and sister maybe that we might see a little later. <laughs> um, so next from Ohlone Elementary, we have Emily Calvillo Arenas. Come on up. Hey there, how you doing? Emily, come on up, please. Eduardo, come on up, right next to her. Everybody here? Good evening, President DeRose, um, Superintendent Rodriguez, and members of the board. I am really proud to be here tonight uh, with Ohlone Student of the Year, Emily Calvillo. And as you can see here, Emily has a very <laughs> loving, caring, and supportive family. And I have to say, uh, I am just a bit overwhelmed being here among them. I feel proud and uh, hopeful, even more hopeful than I normally am to be standing here alongside of them. You all are just a tremendous inspiration to all of us, as are you, Emily. Um, let's see if I can go through her, her family, um, her mom and dad, Oscar and Hilda Calvillo. Here we are. Um, her brothers, Eduardo and Eliseo. There he is. Um, she has uh, loving grandparents, Berta and Emilio. Lots of aunts and uncles who are right there with her all the way. Uh, Belen, Francesca, Sal, and Juan. As well as cousins who are involved and support her as well. Alexis, Micaela, John, Emilio, and Montserrat, all who took time tonight to come down. Oh, and uh, Grandma Sophia also came. Oh, my, my, my. <laughs> she has a very loving and supportive family. Emily was born here in Watsonville and has attended Ohlone since kindergarten. And in fact, her mother, Ilda, was in the very first graduating class of Ohlone School. In fact, everybody in Emily's family are proud graduates of Watsonville High School. Born and bred, raised and proud members of the community. Emily's been an excellent student through all the years. And this year she represented Ohlone at the uh, Santa Cruz County Spelling Bee at UCSC. Emily's teacher says that she's not only a top student academically, she's advanced in English language arts as well as in mathematics and all the tests. But she's also a great team player when it comes to working as a group. Uh, and when she's not in school, Emily enjoys baking, crafts, and caring for her family's horses. She's very confident, and she knows that she can achieve whatever she wants to in her life when she puts her mind to it. And right now, she's thinking of possibly becoming a lawyer or a baker. <laughs> She thinks that she might open a top-notch bakery right here in Watsonville, which I would be totally excited about. And uh, she would, but in order to do this, she would like to travel to France, Paris, <laughs> to get down the fine points of French pastry. And to this end, her parents have both said, assured me that they will support her and volunteer to go along with her on that. All of us at Ohlone are very proud of Emily and her accomplishments and proudly present her to you here tonight as our Student of the Year. Thank you. Do you want to speak in Hi, my name is Emily and I'm here representing Ohlone School. I'd like to thank my teachers, Ms. Enuffer, and especially my family. When I grow up, I'm going to be a baker or I'll be a lawyer. I know I have a lot of goals to accomplish, but anything is possible with family support. My mom says that it takes a village to raise a kid, and this is my village. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I think Trustee Osmondson has something for you there. <laughs> this is for you, Emily Calvillo Arenas. <laughs> You're Thank recognized you. by the faculty of Ohlone Elementary School, and you're recognized for us in, in the, on the Pottle Valley Unified School District Board, and you're recognized by everybody here 
that's in our audience too is recognizing you, aren't you? <laughs> they, you can all clap for her. <laughs> and, and wow, I'm so impressed with you. You're so advanced. <laughs> You're really way advanced in everything, including mathematics, which I am very bad at. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, if you want to go over here for a great photo, we can get a photograph and share that with you. <laughs> we'll, try. we'll do it. Uh, I don't okay. try. Uh, try to see if we can get all of the good <laughs> Congratulations. Okay, thanks to our families for coming. If you um, need to get home to get ready for another day tomorrow, we understand if you can't stay, but congratulations from all of us. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on to item 3.5, governing board comments, uh, reports on standing committee meetings. And I'll start with um, Willie and just go right, right on down the line. Trustee Yehiro. Thank you. So, so what is a hypothesis? Well, last night at the Minty White Science um, Contest uh, show, we found out that a fifth grader proved that air actually weighs something. And the, and the uh, science show last night was outstanding. Minty White, fifth graders and fourth graders did a great job. And I just want to report, re, re, uh, report to the board that it, that it was uh, proven to me that air does weigh something thanks to the fifth grade uh, students. Thank you very much, Minty White. Um, so I just wanted to make a quick comment to um, Dr. Rodriguez and I had the honor of being invited to the wonderful Women of Watsonville event where the Santa Cruz County Women's Commissioners um, honor it, which by the way, two of our teachers from our school district, Ari Parker and um, Lucy Basor, hold seats on our Santa Cruz County Women's Commission honored two local women in Watsonville for their work. Um, Maria Campos with Mo Monarch Services for her work with women in violence and, and young girls, and also Gina Cole for her work in education, and particularly education um, in line with um, issues of substance abuse and tobacco. And so just wanted to honor them and recognize them and thank them for inviting us to be a part of their event. Thank you. Karen? <clears throat> so I, I was at our DLAC meeting, and um, <laughs> Michelle was also there at the beginning, too, talking just about all of the programs that we have for students. Uh, is, that, is that a right way to say it? That help with, um, yeah, that, that, yeah all, the, all the programs we have in the district that help with homework and things like that, she talked about that with um, DLAC. Um, and, um, well, there was a bunch of other things we did too, but DLAC is always a really wonderful place to be because it's really well attended um, by DLAC, ELAC members um, from each school. So it's really well attended. And I also went to the um, 
migrant education, I mean, migrant head start, excuse me, um, migrant head start policy committee meeting. And this is just before um, the program is going to be starting because it's a migrant program, of course, and it starts at the very beginning of April and it goes through November. But we have policy committee meetings with the executive board, not with all of the parents from every single um, daycare center and uh, some of the daycare homes um, at the meeting at this point, but we have the executive committee at the meeting just kind of going over what we're doing to getting to get getting starting how to get started. Um, we're trying to um, work on getting some of the um, daycare centers together. Um, we're really working on a Loney, which is a kind of a new daycare that we're we're working on you know, construction-wise to get it ready to go and and things like that. Thank you. <laughs> Here. Kim? Thank you, Leslie. Um, I want to thank the, our amazing community and our um, young people for coming out um, in Aptos um, for the March uh, for Our Lives um, Against Gun Violence. I want to say that I'm looking forward to um, watching the young people lead our nation to a different and better way of being so that we don't have to worry that kids are not safe anywhere that they go. They should be safe at schools, they should be safe in their communities, their libraries, their movie theaters, their restaurants, at sports events, anywhere we go, kids should be safe and should not. nobody should be targeted by gun violence anymore. And so I'm, I'm just feeling really um, hopeful that um, changes are about to happen, especially when all these young voters um, turn out at the polls. So I want to thank everybody who turned out for that event um, in Aptos. Um, I'm looking forward to a dinner that's upcoming um, where Marshall Tuck will be the featured um, speaker for the County Office of Education and all the other board members in the whole county um, will come together and hear him speak. So that'll be fun. That's on April 9th uh, on a Monday night upcoming. And I did attend um, Aptos. I didn't say this last time, but I attended Aptos High's um, accreditation, uh, it's called, they, all our high schools are accredited by WASC, and that stands for Western Accreditation, no, Western, what is it, Association of Schools Accreditation. Um, so I attended the kickoff. It was really fun. Um, I got to stay back with the parents because I do have a daughter at Aptos High, so I got to make um, feedback both as a board member and as a parent, and I actually haven't heard an outcome. I wasn't there for the exit interview do we do we have any update on the aptos high accreditation um yes yeah, so there is a report out both for them and for watsonville um high school and so we can provide you guys those summary reports um they only receive them orally we receive them in writing a little a few um, about a week later well, it all depends on when the person the chair gives it to us once we get it in writing we'll make sure and give it off to you guys okay thank you mm -hmm. thank you leslie i had the opportunity last week to go to the caesar chavez community awards and if you ever want to see uh, or hear about the great things that are happening locally go to awards like this i was so impressed by the turn the, by the turnout and, the, and there was as you were saying Kim about the young people who spent their winter vac their winter break or winter vacation whatever you want to call it make getting putting together care packages for the homeless or the woman who works at a local church who takes care of the the sick and the elderly it's very easy to concentrate on the negative go to awards like, go to award shows like this and it really does show you all the great things that are happening in our community so I do want to thank them for my invitation Thank you, Jeff. Um, I um, had the the honor to uh, give a presentation to the um, the parent leadership group at, at Calabasas High School or Elementary School last week on Monday, and actually Dr. Rodriguez was there too. Um, this is a really great program. It's um, about a six month program where. Um, Parents can join this group and come and learn about um, the inner workings of a school district. Everywhere, from, everything from site council, volunteering site council at the site, uh, to what happens in the superintendent's office. And for me, I was able to share with them 
about what a board does. And, um, you know, it could be very dry, but um, what I chose to do is just give them my story because I was one of them. I was the mom who volunteered in the classrooms and when my kids were little and um, started my involvement there and um, am here now. And I just really wanted to share with them and the community that um, a board seat is, is open really to anybody to run who um, who is eligible and who has the um, the desire to give back and make a change. So that was really, that was great for me. I really, really enjoyed that. So hope to do that again some someday. Um, and then um, this afternoon I went to um, Mar Vista and I saw the fourth grade, one of the fourth grade classes do um, a play on California history. It was really, really good, really well done. Um, I actually learned something that I did not know, so <laughs> through a song. So they did a really, really great job. Um, anyway, that, that's um, it for me, and um, the rest of the board has gone, so we will move on <coughs> um, to my printed copy. Okay, we're at item 4.1, and that's approval of the agenda. Um, so I'm looking for a motion from a board member to approve the agenda. I so move. And is there a second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 601. And item 5.1, um, this is approval of the minutes for our March 14th regular board meeting. And um, is there a motion to approve? I'd like to make a motion to approve. And with that, can I s put in a request that on future minutes that we have a little bit more of the dialogue of the board and public comments noted in the minutes? Is that possible? Sure. I, it seems like sure. we used to have that, and it's kind of faded away. A so little bit more detail. Just to, just to give a little bit more, mm -hmm. if you would, meet to the sure. substance of it. Yeah. So that's my Good idea. motion. Okay, so that was a motion? Yes. Okay, so I'm looking for a second. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Motion passes 601 with the noted request for change and um, at the March 14th board meeting we also did our financing corporation board meeting which we um, we do generally each December um, this was a special one to actually dissolve the corporation um, which we are all on that board as well um, and this had to do um, with a certificate of participation, which is a funding mechanism. And um, that's why the corporation was, um, was developed. And since that COP was paid off, we were able to dissolve it. So um, this is special board meeting of the District Financing Corporation minutes. So do I have a motion for approval? I so move to approve. And is there a second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 601. And next is um, item six, our high school student board representatives. Do we have any representatives from our high schools tonight? No? Okay. What happened to them? Hopefully we'll see break. them back soon. <laughs> Just what we do? No, no, that would be um, agenda, sorry, under public comment. Okay, this is um, high school representatives come and give us an update on their site. Okay, but have you got a card filled out for, if you do want to speak, there are cards in the foyer. So you want to fill that out and put the agenda item number there and we'll call you up. And you can just bring it up here. Alicia, can you help him? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now I got lost. Okay. 
7.1. And so this is, I'm going to close our regular meeting and open a public hearing for PVUSD Sunshine proposal to PF, PVFT. And report by Ms. Colleen. Dr. Colleen. Uh, yes, thank you. President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, for board consideration, this is the Sunshine Proposal from PVUSD to our Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers for a multi-year agreement. Um, for the district in accordance with the RADA Act is sunshining this proposal for 2018-19 as per the following articles. Article 5, calendar. Article 7, wages and related matters. Article 8, health and welfare benefits. And this proposal does not include additional items which may be sunshined in the future uh, during the course of the negotiations. Okay, are there any speakers to this item? Are there any questions or comments from the board? No? Okay, we'll be voting on this correct later in the agenda. So there's no public comment, no comments from the board. So I'll close the public hearing and we'll reopen the regular meeting. Thank you. So item 8.1 is public comment. Um, so again, if um, anybody wants to speak to an item, we do have to have the cards turned in before the item is called. That's something I failed to um, mention yeah. early, earlier. So I'm glad the gentleman got his card in. Um, so how many do we have? We have about 10. Um, we, but we have several here that don't have a number or an, a, a, uh, an agenda item number on here. So I'm going to read the name. If you want to talk to the open session, please just let me know. Marcella Salas Ibera, and excuse my pronunciation. Barra. Ibarra, thank you. Did you want to talk to the open agenda item? Yes? Okay. What about um, Alba Rivas? Open agenda item? Okay. Well, no, just one moment, ma'am. Do you want to speak to the open agenda item? Are those a charter school people? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's no agenda item. So Okay. Um, Alba, uh, Rosa, Luis, and Guadalupe, these are all for the charter school. Is that correct? Okay. That's a different item. Okay. Thank you. What item number is that uh, that I'll they would to, be speaking to? I'll have to look and see. Um, it's actually it is non-agenda. Okay. Well, then we will call them up. Okay. So we have more than 10? Of? It's not Lynn Scott. Ten. We have about 15. Okay. So um, what we'll do is we will call up three people at a time. Um, let's set the clock for two minutes each, please. And um, I think you'll call three at a time, so if you can line up and be ready to speak when it's your turn, that would be great. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay, so the first we'll have Greg Tucker come up, followed by David Patina, Patino, excuse me, and then followed by Mirna Guerra. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Rodriguez, President DeRose, and board members. Also, good evening to my colleagues, community members who have come out tonight. <clears throat> my name is Greg Tucker. I've been an educator for 22 years. I taught for 11 years in Sacramento, where my father was a teacher for 35 years. My aunt and uncle, the Grassmeyers, taught special ed and math in Pleasanton in the 70s and 80s. My grandmother taught in Mendocino County for seven years to uh, the children of loggers in the 1920s. I know quite a bit about education. It's been part of my family my entire life. But I truly don't understand what this district and this board is thinking. From 2010 to 2017, my site has lost 101 teachers. During this time period, the site has averaged right around 65 certificated employees. And we have averaged 14 and a half certificated employees lost each year. That is a 22% employee churn rate. <clears throat> Industries with high employee churn, like fast food, approach 100%. Retail sales is about 55% employee turnover. 
the industries with the lowest employee churn, wholesale trade, finance, federal government jobs, and state and local education. These industries average less than 2% employee turnover. <clears throat> Again, my site is averaging over 22% employee turnover <clears throat> in a district or in an industry where the average is 1.3% on average. This is a failure of an immense magnitude. This is failure that should be impossible to ignore by the board responsible for overseeing this district. This is a failure of management, a failure of community, a failure of the Board of Education. This employee churn is costly to students, to families, to the community. Employee turnover is a simple way to evaluate a company or industry for volatility. If you look at the numbers, this district is in danger. Financial statements are just one way to evaluate district health. You can look at the reserves and say, look, we have money, we're safe and healthy. I'm suggesting that that is short-sighted, limited, misguided perspective. Take a look at staffing and you can see another layer of an organization's health or its disease. Think of any job that you've ever had, digging ditches, flipping hamburgers, selling clothes, answering phones, building houses, any job. Imagine doing that job while always training new employees, while feeling like there's no continuity, no consistency, no predictability to your team. How long before you would leave that job? Days, weeks, maybe a year? Once an employee turnover rate increases, reaches a number like 22%, like at my site, like in this district, it should come as no surprise if the churn rate continues and increases, people leave jobs when they see their colleagues leave. What can the Board of Education do? What can the district do? It's no secret that many employees look at pay as an indicator of their happiness at work. The moment an employee is unable to pay their bills or live a comfortable lifestyle, they will naturally think to themselves, is this the job for me? The more financially strapped they are, the less comfortable their living situation, the more likely they are to leave. That churn, that turnover, that organizational failure can be avoided by keeping employees feeling well compensated. No raise and a threat to benefits makes employees look elsewhere. A tiny raise while witnessing huge increases to management salaries makes employees feel devalued because they are literally being devalued. This board and this district need to stop this BS. Our students deserve fully qualified teachers. Our community deserves to know that the teachers who teach their first child will stay for their second and third children, maybe even their grandchildren. I got one last line. This is about community, it's about respect, it's about what this Board of Education and this district value. Thank you, you guys. Uh, David? Yes. Hello, uh, Dr. Rodriguez and school board members. Uh, it's nice to be here and talk to you. Uh, I'm an eight-year teacher here in the PVUSD, David Patino from Renaissance High School. Um, well, first, um, I'd like to talk about last school board meeting. I'm pleased to see so many. This Monday, for the first time, three quarters of the way through the school year, we're able to finally be fully staffed of teachers. We finally got our last teacher hired uh, for a fine arts position. I know increasing the compensation for teachers could have really helped fill this position sooner. And um, also, uh, 
We have been operating for two quarters, the second quarter and the third full quarter, without a permanent principal. So um, please expedite the hiring process. I know that we're interviewing people, so I would really like to have a permanent principal so that we do not have to begin the next school year without a principal. As for negotiations, now we are in fact finding. I said that at the last board meeting that I do not want to strike, but I will strike. I hope that we can work towards a solution without disrupting the education of the students. Thank you so much for your time. Myrna? After Myrna, we're going to have Victoria Antonio, Maria Mesa, and Abigail Adolfo, please. Adolfo. I'll get Thank you. Uh, good evening, Board President DeRose, Superintendent Rodriguez, and members of the board. My name is Myrna Guerrero, and I want to thank you for your time to address a matter that occurred at Watsonville High School and, a manner, and in the manner of that it was handled on 2-2018. The incident that I would like to address happened to my daughter, Maya, and her freshman science class. Due to my limited time, I will be condensing this incident. On 2-20, Mr. Don Brown ranted racial remarks directed directly to the fifth period science class and to my daughter. This is what he said, and I'm paraphrasing. When I first started working in this community, there weren't that many brown skins. Now there are a lot of brown skins, and you know why? Because your families are working in the fields. This is what he said to my daughter, and I'm condensing this version as well. Maya asked to go to the restroom. Mr. Brown says no, that she needs to hold it, and asks her if she thinks that her parents can go to the bathroom anytime they want when they're working in the fields. Maya replies, my parents don't work in the fields. What makes you think my parents work in the fields? And Mr. Brown replies that it's to be expected. That evening, I emailed Watsonville High School principal, vice principals, and Mr. Brown requesting a meeting as soon as possible. On 221, the following occurs. Maya is called into the office, and Ms. Ligoretta gets her statement. I also meet with her, and I personally give her my statement. Mr. Brown leaves me a voicemail at work, and we talk over the phone later that day. He is apologetic um, both times, and I requested him to meet with him in person. On 226, we had a meeting with vice principal, Ms. Romo, Mr. Brown, my sister, Martha, and myself. I asked Mr. Brown for his side of the story, allowing him that courtesy. His explanation summed up that he was stressed, overwhelmed, and that he didn't have his filter on that day. On 227, Maya was moved from her class to a new one, in which she has now fallen behind because she has had to be, she's had to condense a month and a half of work into two weeks because Mr. Brown's class is behind. Over the course of the following three weeks, Maya writes her statement, turns it into Ms. Romo's class. I requested a follow-up meeting on 36 and 316. On 319, I finally received a response, and on 320, I replied to Ms. Legareta and Ms. Roma with additional concerns, information, and requested five things. That additional investigation towards his remarks of conduct regarding his racist remarks were to be expressed to the entire classroom, proper discipline of his conduct. This event documented in detail and placed into his personnel file. All of the parents from that classroom notified, and personal notification from the superintendent that all the items were going to be completed. I emailed Ms. Legareta with the request to have it back by Friday of that week, which was 3.23. I did not email Dr. Rodriguez at that time. I emailed Dr. Rodriguez on 3.26, um, who has been very responsive. Thank you for that. And was made aware that Ms. Legareta did not forward the emails to Dr. Rodriguez, which is exactly what parents, teachers, students, and PVUSD staff told me that she would do. She did inform me that this would be handled as a Title IX incident due to the fact that this incident is racist in nature. I posted it on social media, and in two days, the amount of concerns, personal stories, and support flooded into, in, in that also brought light, similar issues with Mr. Brown and Ms. Ligaretta alike. So this is my question. If this is supposed to be um, treated as a Title IX incident, why was it handled like that since the beginning? Because it's been over a month. And if it was supposed to be treated that way, then I would expect proper discipline for Ms. Ligaretta as well. Why are incidents like this automatically reported to the superintendent's office? I know that my daughter's incident is not as crucial as other incidents that are going around in this nation, but this is the foundation of what is wrong out there today, so why not handle it at its core? That my request is to have my initial request upheld and to have Ms. Ligaretta's practices reviewed when, when handling situations like this. Parents and students should be able to go to their administration and trust them. I will follow up with you via email. Thank you. Victoria? And Victoria will be followed by Maria Mesa and Abigail. 
My name is Victoria, and I like Miss Amora because he's a good teacher. I want to stay in my school. I want to stay in my too. I want to he stay with me, Miss mm -hmm. Mora. Thank you. Maria, Maria. Francisco, would you mind readjusting that for them? Since you got up and started it, you have a job now. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, disculpe, disculpe, sí. Va a ocupar, um, va a hablar en español. Sí. Okay, um, vamos a ocupar que traduzca a Virginia. Está bien. Can you hear me? Okay. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es María Mesa. Good, mo good evening. My name is uh, Maria. Uh, estamos aquí nosotros los padres de familia We're apoyando parents to support a nuestros maestros our teachers y a nuestros niños and our children. No queremos We don't want que nuestros maestros se vayan our teachers, de nuestra institución. We don't want our teachers to leave. Nosotros queremos we que ellos sigan colaborando con nosotros. Continue collaborating, collaborating with us. No, no queremos también uh, ma maestros sustitutos. We also don't want substitute teachers. Pienso y pensamos nosotros también los padres. I think and we also other parents think que nuestros niños no aprenderían that our children si a cada momento if every moment estarían cambiando de maestros. Changing teachers. Nosotros queremos we want que nuestros niños sean unos niños that our children to be children preparados para el futuro. For the future. Así como ustedes están preparados, Just like you are prepared, nosotros queremos que igual nuestros niños we also want our children to sean be así, to be like you. que algún día ellos puedan they can ejercer una carrera. Uh, have a career. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Espero que tomen en cuenta mi and I hope you take lo que les vine a plantear. Gracias. Thank you. Ab Abigail? Abigail? Uh, um, Abigail will be followed by um, Anthony Flores, Natty Lopez, and Kathleen Kilpatrick, please. Hey, Abigail. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre Good evening. Es Abigail. Um, My name is Abigail. Uh, venimos a apoyar los maestros. We're here to support the teachers. Son muy importantes para It's, nuestros they are very niños. Important for our children. Se necesita que se le aumente el pago a los And they, the maestros need para their que wages los increased. estudiantes tengan los mejores maestros. So Gracias. that the students can have the best teachers. Gracias. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Flores. Good evening. Um, so there have been a lot of things that have been going on in Watsonville High that have not been spoken up about. We have the issue that happened with Don Brown. Now we have an issue with the teacher who thinks it's okay to go and tell kids that they have a mental illness. That is not okay. I don't think it's okay, and I'm pretty sure parents don't think it's okay. And this teacher is Abel Mejia. He's a world history teacher. And from what I've been told, the stories are bad. He de 
he degrades kids to the point where they don't stand up for themselves. We come to school to learn, not to be degraded. Kids have gone and reported it to the principal and they've said that nothing has happened. Now, I'm not sure if there's an investigation that's been going on and we don't know about, but we're not very informed on about it. Kids have left his class for that reason. They didn't leave his class because it was a hard class. That's his excuse. Kids have left this class because the environment is horrible. Kids are degraded. It's not okay. And thankfully, I'm not in that class. The reason I'm here, I'm speaking up for the kids who are too scared to speak up for themselves because they are worried that their grade will be affected if they come and speak up. This is not okay, and this should be reviewed. Um, there should be an investigation, too. Um, so I've been told these stories, and I'm here to speak up for the kids who can't. And it's, it's kind of sad that not only is it Mejia, but there are different teachers, from what I've been told, who do the same thing. Um, there have been too many issues in Watsonville High that have been going on this year with coaches, teachers, and staff. Something needs to be changed, and we need to start reevaluating the whole school at this point. We need to... We just, we need to watch our teachers sometimes, and the teachers need to watch themselves. They need to watch what they say, and that needs to be said to them. Thank you for your time. Hi, hi Kathleen. How are you? <laughs> well, I'm good. I, good. You know, a lot of issues seem to be going. I, I have another one here. We're here to give you a, a heads up on a close call. Uh, which I saw as a symptom of the ongoing issues that the district has had with um, safety and risk. And I'm just going to stick, since I'm here for SAS, I'm going to stick with pesticide issues tonight. So yesterday afternoon, Melissa, my friend who's here, uh, requested my help after we were visiting the County Agricultural Commissioner on the new <laughs> pesticide regulations. Uh, that affects school surrounding, uh, surrounding fields. Ohlone teachers had been notified of a scheduled fumigation for termites that was supposed to occur over spring break. And while they appreciated that it was time for the buildings to air out, they felt like it was really short notice. Both chemicals uh, that were to be used are highly toxic and they would have had to remove any, any classroom pets, all the plants, and they had concerns about gases lingering in enclosed spaces. So imagine these Ohlone teachers who were so re recently thrilled by the conversion of the adjacent field to organic strawberries to find out that the district planned to apply fumigants inside their classrooms. Um, you know, there is this Healthy Schools Act. I've been here talking about it before. It requires um, postings and parent notifications for chemicals used. There's a specific process if it's something that isn't on the annual posting. I looked on the district website. I could not find the list of chemicals that were uh, supposed to be, that there was notification for for the entire year. I know that the parents at Ohlone were not notified and that the teachers had very short notice. Um, you know, the district has an integrated pest management plan, but it's really just the skeleton. It's been three years since the Healthy Schools Act was made stronger and uh, our district has not yet caught up. Uh, they have, uh, I don't even know if it complies with the letter of the law, but it certainly doesn't imply with the intent. An integrated pest management is supposed to be a process and a plan. Uh, it's much like what I learned in health care. There are steps. Prevention comes first. That didn't happen at Ohlone. Monitoring is required. That requires training. I don't really think the staff has been trained. The maintenance and operation director couldn't even tell me what kind of termites or how bad it was. Localized treatment is the next step. I don't think that was done. There were some structural repairs, but no low risk uh, local applications were tried. And there's supposed to be some investigation of alternatives in the least toxic alternatives should be used, and there is heat treatment, which is a, an alternative to um, fumigation. So instead of skipping to the most hazardous option, we need a transparent and open process that involves the community. We need staff training. We need clear communication. We also have some issues with the rollout of uh, Department of Pesticide regulations, new school regulations, and uh, we would be happy to meet with the district safety coordinator and maintenance and operation 
And I really advise again that the Habitat, Habitat Management Committee be revived and I still have my binders and I'm, I'm happy to participate. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Natty, Natty Lopez. Natty Lopez, okay. Next we'll have Melissa Dennis, followed by Gilbert, Gilberto. Gilberto. Gilberto, thank you, Karen. And, and she'll be followed by Alba. Hello. Hi. Um, my oh, you're here? Yeah. Okay, here. Sorry about that. No problem. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Natividad López. My name is Natividad Vengo en representación de, de, mis, de mis maestros. I'm here uh, representing de la escuela my teachers. La Radcliffe. Uh, vengo a pedir que, que haga un, este, un sueldo justo para los maestros. That, uh, porque este, for, uh, ya ve que just, en todo es, va subiendo la, todas la, la, las cosas y quiero un... Un, este, un sueldo justo para ellos and para I poder vivir aquí se necesita un sueldo justo a, entonces uh, y no queremos maestros este, uh, sustitutos queremos maestros que ayuden a nuestros hijos para que salgan adelante teachers that teach our students so that they can get ahead would you mind asking her to pause so I can hear what you're saying because like thank you se puede, eh, puede hacer pausa para yo poder inter interpretar entre medio. Sí, le digo, este, queremos un suelto justo para ellos, entonces, este, y no queremos sustitutos, incluso. We eh, want a just wage el, for them, and we don't want El día martes y ayer mi niña dijo que tenía un, este, un maestro sustituto. And my uh, uh, my daughter told me that on Tuesday she had a substitute teacher. Y, y el maestro le dijo que era un este que, que porque no le pagan bien por eso no va a clases entonces yo que le yo le que le contesto a la niña and the teacher said that because he doesn't get good wages he doesn't go to classes so what do I tell my daughter okay eso es lo que le pedimos a ustedes que por favor nos ayuden a que tengan un suelto justo los maestros and that's para what que en el futuro los hijos pues tengan un, un mejor este una mejor carrera. And that's why I'm here to ask you to give the teachers just wages so that they, the students or my, the children can have a good future. Gracias. Thank you. Y esto, Thank you. Buenas noches. And that's all. Um, my name is Melissa Dennis, and I'm a third grade teacher at Ohlone Elementary School. Um, so I'm following up with what Kathleen Kilpatrick was talking about earlier. So we have a termite problem at Ohlone, and we were slated to be tented over the spring break. Um, we were notified about the fumigation, but we didn't know what the um, fumigants or the pesticides were, were going to be that were going to be used. So we did find that out on Monday night. Um, I rushed home and, and looked them up. One of them I knew already what it was because it's a pesticide that's used in the strawberry fields. And uh, you, you might remember me. I'm one of the um, teachers that's been really active with um, trying to reduce the amount of pesticides used around our schools. Um, so I already knew that chloropicrin was a really toxic uh, pesticide that has so toxic they've banned it altogether in the European Union. Um, yet we were going to be using it over spring break to uh, fumigate our classrooms. And we worked really hard to get a one mile buffer zone. We, we ended up with a quarter mile buffer zone of chloropicrin, but it seemed kind of silly to the teachers to be using chloropicrin in the classroom when we were trying to get a one mile buffer outside of the classroom. Uh, so uh, we wrote a letter to the risk manager and to the facilities director. And uh, luckily the fumigation has been canceled. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful for the swift, swift response by the district. But I think this highlights uh, what Kathleen Kilpatrick was talking about, where uh, what's missing, I think, is a workable IPM, an uh, integrated pest management plan, that will address these situations as they arise. When you see you have a pest, 
what is the least toxic way to deal with it first? What are the alternatives that we're going to try first? And then if it comes down to needing to use um, some fumigants, sometimes that might be necessary. And I think the uh, teachers will be understanding of that when it is ne in fact necessary. But we found that in this case, uh, we hadn't exhausted all the alternatives yet. Um, and the other point I wanted to make before I go is uh, the risk manager leads a safety committee. And from what I understand, they haven't been happening monthly. They've been happening quarterly, but they've been being um, canceled. So I think that if we had more regular safety committee meetings, things like a integrated pest management plan could be uh, put in place, and then it could avoid um, difficulties like what we've had this last week with um, the back and forth between teachers and the district and, and uh, worrying about all these chemicals in our students. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Buenas noches, doctora Rodriguez y demás miembros de la mesa directiva. Eh, mi nombre es Alba Rivas. Good evening. My name is Alba Rivas. Y estoy aquí para, hoy este día presentamos la petición para nuestra nueva escuela, Waxonville Prep School. Y This, today we presented a petition for Watsonville, ¿qué, ¿cuál era la escuela, señora? Waxonville Prep School. Watsonville Prep School. Y la razón por la que estoy aquí es porque estoy, bueno, estoy a favor de las charter schools. Y And the reason pues, I'm here is I'm in favor of the charter schools. Como padres queremos pues una nueva, una mejor educación para nuestros hijos. Y And as parents we want a better education for our children. Y esta escuela pues las expectativas que tiene son muy altas a nivel school, educativo y the tanto en estructura. Are very high at the educational level. Y la, sobre todo lo que más me impactó cuando fui a conocer las escuelas que están funcionando en Gilroy y en Hollister. La, el trato que los maestros les dan a los niños y la atención y la estructura que les dan, la mm. enseñanza es, es, pues para mí como madre de familia. And what I liked, I visited a school in Hollister and Gilroy, charter schools, and I liked the way the teachers uh, treated the children and the way they taught them. Y sobre todo, otra cosa que a mí me llamó la atención como observando las aulas, la, son grupos pequeños de alumnos. And what I saw, the classrooms were small y tienen groups. tres maestros para, para un salón de clase. And they have three teachers for each class. Y, y tienen una buena estructura, fue lo que más, más me agradó. Y, y And I like the structure. Cuando vi también en las, todas las áreas que yo visité, que todos los niños levantaban la mano para participar. And what I noticed, uh, my visit at all the children raised their hands to participate. Y, y esa es la razón por la cual estoy aquí y pues espero pues poder contar con, con su apoyo para obtener pues esta escuela. And that's the reason why I'm here. I hope to count on your support for this school. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Gilberto? Gilberto? Alberto. Uh, Rosa? R Rosa? Luisa. Luisa. Okay, so after Luisa, we'll have Rosa and then Guadalupe speak, please. Luisa, you're next. You're next. Next. How are you tonight? Muy bien. Buenas noches. Good evening. Gracias por la oportunidad. Thank you for the opportunity. Doctora Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez. Y miembros del comité. And members of the committee. Um, mi nombre es María Luisa Hernández. My name is María Luisa Hernández. Y estoy aquí en representación And I'm here to represent de padres um, in represent on behalf of the parents que estamos pidiendo el apoyo de usted And we are asking for your support para las escuelas Navigator. Uh, disculpe, ¿para cuáles escuelas? Navigator. Yeah. For the Navigator schools. Um, pedimos su apoyo We are for your para que acepten la petición que le fue entregada hoy 
for you to accept the petition that was submitted to you today? Porque como padre, como madre, as a mother, tengo un sueño. I have a dream. Un sueño para mis hijos. A dream for my children. Y ese sueño es que un día and that dream is that one day ellos lleguen a ser unas personas profesionales. Uh, that they will be prof uh, profession professional people. Pero ese sueño se vio frustrado porque miré el nivel de educación que tienen nuestras escuelas aquí en Watsonville. But that I was frustrated by the dream because I saw the level of education here in Watsonville. Y es por eso que yo apoyo a Watsonville Prep. And that is why I support Watsonville Prep. Porque su innovación en la educación because the innovation in education es de las más nuevas y las que están dando resultado. And it's the newest and the ones that are having results. Yo les pido, por favor, I ask you to please, como madre, as a mother, que nos apoyen. That you support us. Es una esperanza que tenemos para el futuro de nuestros hijos. It's a hope or dream that we have for the future of our children. Muchas gracias por su tiempo. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hola, buenas noches a todos. Mi nombre es Rosa Saavedra. Um, Good evening, everyone. My name is Rosa Saavedra. Yo estoy también aquí representando a los padres uh, de la pro, para la proposición de la escuela. I am uh, also here supporting the parents for the uh, school proposition. Estoy a favor de que se abra esta escuela porque yo la miro como una oportunidad. I'm in favor of opening this school because I see it as an opportunity para mi hija y su futuro. For my daughter and her future. También lo miro como una oportunidad para nuestra comunidad. I also see it as an opportunity for our community. Porque como nuestra comunidad va creciendo. Because as our community grows. También van creciendo las necesidades de nosotros los de la comunidad de, de nuevas escuelas y nuevas proposiciones. And also the need for new schools um, is growing also. La visión de esta escuela tiene niveles estándares muy altos. The vision of the school has standard, standards very high. Tiene niveles de educación que a mí me gustaría que mi hija desarrollara liderazgo, que mi hija fuera profesional en el futuro. Y and pienso que esta escuela um, it, it, there's an opportunity for leadership and for development and for um, something great for my daughter in the future. Y pienso que esta escuela, si nos puede dar eso a nosotros y a nuestros alumnos, va a apoyar a toda la comunidad en el futuro y va a hacer que la, nuestra comunidad, nuestro pueblo crezca más. And I think that if this school is able to offer this, um, I, it will be good for the future and for the community. Y les agradezco la oportunidad de dejar expresar mis sentimientos. And I appreciate the opportunity to express my sentiments. Y pedirles que analicen la petición. And ask you to analyze or, or look at the petition. Y su apoyo para and your poder support. abrirla. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre Good es evening. Gilberto Pozos. My name is Gilberto este, estoy Pozos. Estoy aquí también en representación de este Watsonville Prep School. I'm also here representing este, Watsonville Prep School. Me gustaría mucho como padre, I would vengo like representando very much también a muchos parent. padres. I'm here representing many parents. Este, que nos den la oportunidad that you give para us nuestros the hijos el, el, el derecho de poder tener una educación fiable, the right con una to buena estructura. With great structure. Um, me gustaría que mis hijos, este, ellos crecieran con una mentalidad de, de poder superarse, de superación. I would like for my children to grow up with a mentality of, of uh, achieving. Y esta escuela siento en mi corazón que tiene las puertas abiertas para darles todas las oportunidades están ahí para nuestros hijos y and quiero I, que ellos los, la aprovechen. And I feel that this school will give them the opportunity, the doors will open for that. 
Eh, como les digo, tiene una buena estructura, buena enseñanza y realmente me interesa que mis hijos puedan tener un, un buen futuro, que algún día puedan estar sentados quizás ahí junto a ustedes o, o no sé, el presidente de los Estados Unidos, qué sé yo, ¿verdad? And uh, the school has a good structure, it's good teaching, um, and I'm sure there's to be a good future. I would like to see my children seated up there with you or a president, I don't know. So, por favor, este, les pido de favor que, que este, revi este, vean la aplicación que se ha este, metido y, y que nos den la oportunidad de tener una escuela como and estas aquí en, en Watsonville. And I would like you to uh, read the proposal that was pre presented and, uh, Gracias. E and thank you. Next, we have Guadalupe. And after Guadalupe, we have Marcela. Buenas noches. Good evening. Mi nombre es Guadalupe Gallardo. My name is Guadalupe Gallardo. Y estoy aquí en representación de muchos padres de familia de, mo de mi comunidad. I'm here representing many parents in the community. Pidiéndoles a ustedes su apoyo. Asking for your support. Por favor, de Please. la petición que se les fue entregada mm -hmm. hoy. The petition that was submitted today. Para Navigator Schools. For Navigator Schools. Escogí pelear por Watsonville Prep School. I chose to fight for Watsonville Prep School. Porque en el recorrido que fui en la uh, uh, Watsonville um, Hollister Prep School. Because in the time that I went to Hollister Prep School. Me encantó mirar cómo los maestros interactúan con los niños. I love to see how the teachers interacted with the children. Cómo los niños están tan felices, um, ansiosos por participar en la clase. How some children are happy and anxious to participate in the classroom. Y creo que mis hijos y todos los niños de mi comunidad se merecen esta grandiosa oportunidad. And I think that my children and all the children uh, in the community uh, deserve this grand opportunity. Y les pedimos su apoyo, por favor, que escuchen nuestras voces. And we ask for your support and to listen to our voices. Muchas gracias. Thank you. My name is Marcela, and I am choosing Watsonville Prep School for my child because I believe my child will have a shot at a great education in this kind of school. It's wonderful teachers, the technology in the classrooms, amazing, well-behaved, super smart, positive, driven, and incredibly confident kids. That is what I saw during the tour of the Hollister School, and that's what I want for my son here in Watsonville. Thank you. President DeRose, that's our last speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody who came out. So item 9.0 um, is employee organization comments and we'll begin with 9.1 PVFT. We do have actually, can you hold on just a second? We have a speaker, Ramiro Madrano. And can you put three minutes on the clock for this one, please? Good evening. Buenas noches. My name is Ramiro Medrano. I'm a counselor here in the district for almost three years now. I was also born and raised here in Watsonville. And uh, I'm here to support our teachers, our faculty. It's the first time I speak to you on this topic. Um, I wanted to come tonight not to talk about budgets, not to talk about numbers, because honestly, I don't understand half of that. But f to put a face to this struggle. I, just a little bit of background on me. 
Born and raised in Watsonville, I went to Pajaro Elementary when I was in elementary. Went to Pajaro Middle School, I went to Watsonville High School. I did not graduate from Watsonville High. At the time, Watsonville High was built for 1,700 students. In, in 1997, my last year there, there were over 3,000 students enrolled. And there were zero counselors because of budget cuts. The year after my last year, counselors were hired again. So pretty much my entire time at Watsonville High, I didn't have a counselor. I didn't have anybody to pull me out of class, to tell me I was messing up. I'm a first generation. I'm the oldest in my family. I didn't have older brothers or sisters to tell me who to go to, who to talk to. Teachers were too bogged down. I feel, and I'm not laying the, 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 the sole responsibility on the district for me not graduating, but I feel like the district let me down. The first time anybody ever counseled me was a friend who told me that I could still enroll in Cabrillo after not graduating high school. I did not know that. Nobody ever told me that. The rest is history. I went to Cabrillo, it took me a long time. I didn't get any financial aid because I didn't graduate. But I still made it. I worked my whole way through Cabrillo, five years, when it usually takes two years to transfer to a four-year university, it took me five. I went to CSUMB, I stayed local, because even though I had a 3.5 GPA at Cabrillo, I wanted to stay local to help my family. I did. I don't regret it. After that, I got married. I have two daughters. I enrolled in San Jose State. And just two, three years ago, actually about a year ago, I got my master's, my counseling credential, and I'm here now. I'm frustrated because I'm, I feel like the district is letting me down again. I can't buy a house in this community. I was born and raised in this community. My parents worked their entire lives. My parents are sick of working so much and for this community. I'm a product of you guys. And I'm here. I want to give back. I want to stay here a long time. My girls are enrolled at Alianza. My little girl is in first grade. She reads at a fifth grade level. I just went to the Alianza Kinder Roundup for my youngest daughter. She knew her numbers till 39. She knew all her colors. She, they, they are both fully bilingual. I want them to stay in these schools so they can improve our schools. I want to stay a counselor in this district so I can improve this district, give back to my community. But I feel like I'm being pushed out. I feel like I can't buy a house in this place because even though now there's a program that gives us down payment, man, I have a down payment. I've been saving for 10 years for this moment. What I can't do is afford a $2,500 payment on a house, a $3,000 payment on a house. With, with the, you know, what I make in this district, I, I can't. I can't do it, and I can't offer the, the, the level of comfort that I want to offer that I didn't have to my daughters and my family. I know I went over my time, I'm sorry. But I'm here to say that we need a fair contract. We need to have a living wage in this community. And I am not yet tenured. And, 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 and that's part of the reason why I hadn't spoken before. But even though I am not tenured, if we strike, I am striking with everybody else. Thank you very much. Francisco. Thank you, Francisco Rodriguez uh, with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, what you just heard uh, comes from a teacher, from a, a certificated staff member 
um, of which there are many in our district. And they want to stay here. And they want to have their children uh, do, do well here. You heard a lot of parents, they want their children to do well here. And you have a choice. You have money. You have so much money, there's charter maintenance organizations lining up to skim off the money that is supposed to go to English language learners, to foster kids, and to students with low social economic status. That's how much money you have. And you could use that money to ensure that people like the last speaker is able to afford a house here, who can pay for their health care and be here. The proposal you send us via email a few hours after the mediator released us to fact-finding does not do that for us. In fact, as I mentioned to you earlier, we believe that if we're talking total compensation, it could possibly be a pay cut on the third year out. If you remember, our members are okay with saving you $2.5 million, not just last year, uh, next year, but the year after that and the year after that, through higher co-pays in doctor visits, higher pres prescription pay, uh, payments. In addition, we also committed to helping or ensuring that our members who have double coverage move away from that. They maintain the same level of benefits, but save you an additional $500,000. That's $3 million right there that you will be saving. You saying that you're giving us a 3% raise in 1819? Well, no, that's not a raise. We're shifting money from our benefit side to the salary side. That's not a raise. And in fact, that 1% for uh, $1 million for 1% increase is for all of your employees, including your management. So not only are we saving you a lot of money, but you're not putting all that money back into our salaries. And that's why we submitted those information requests uh, today and last week to see where exactly your numbers are because those charts that you sent via email in your so-called negotiations update that had several omissions, including the fact that you want to close out negotiations for the year that you just now sunshined. You weren't even aware, probably not even aware until recently that there was going to be a proposal to us for the year 2018-19. So you've heard a lot of um, reasons why we believe that um, the proposal you're giving us is not acceptable. Now, I also told you prior to closed session that we would be sending you some dates. I believe the dates have been sent for uh, possible negotiations. And we will continue to negotiate with you. But we need to see reasonable proposals from you. Again, we are in fact finding. We intend to follow that process. But at any time that you want to give us a proposal for a fair contract, we're willing to sit down and talk about it. And I just wanted uh, uh, to make also a, a few more comments. Um, you may be aware this last weekend uh, there was a convention, the California Federation of Teachers Convention. Um, and I just wanted to report on a couple of things that um, some resolutions that were passed that um, our state uh, federation takes very seriously. Uh, one of those was holding, continue in our attempts to hold charter maintenance organizations accountable. They, to, or that, to make sure that they follow all of the rules that you as a board 
have to follow, including the Brown Act, as well as all of the schools that uh, they support. The other was a commitment to uh, Tony Thurmond for Superintendent of Public Instruction, who, as you know, is running against the uh, previously spoken about candidate for the same position and um, has not accepted money from the Charter Schools Association. And finally, I would like to also um, ask that you consider um, uh, what the two previous speakers, uh, Kathleen Kilpatrick and Melissa Dennis spoke about in regards to the safety committee. Remember, we had a lot of problems um, in the past with our benefits committee meetings being canceled um, and you being unable to implement to the de detriment, not just of you, but ourselves uh, in savings because those $2.5 million that we agreed to help you save, we could have started saving those about a year and a half ago. But because the committee, the benefits committee was not meeting, that means we lost possibly anywhere from three to five million dollars. And so we don't want the safety committee to go the same way. So please make sure that we have those monthly meetings so that we can address safety issues at our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have anyone here from CSEA? Um, Pavam? Good evening, President DeRose, um, Superintendent uh, Rodriguez, and members of the board. I'm Brett Neff for Principal Doloni School. I'll be speaking on behalf of Pavam tonight. My comments are uh, really pretty simple, um, but I would like to start tonight uh, by mentioning uh, some great work that is getting done across our district uh, that we as school administrators, uh, department directors, and supervisors uh, recognize and are very impressed with. The first is in the area of safety, actually, which has been come up a few times tonight already. Um, Sheila Shanahan and her department are doing a lot to bolster our safety plans. I'm not withstanding other comments that have been made here tonight, perhaps, but um, uh, from our point of view, actually, there's an awful lot going on, and they're, they're doing an awful lot to bolster our safety plans, our procedures, and our preparedness. And this work is resulting in improved safety for our students and our staff, as well as in uh, reductions in accidents that lead to workmen's compensation um, uh, claims. Uh, secondly, is in the area of facilities, and someone else spoke to this earlier as well, um, the area of facilities improvements. Um, and maintenance that's being done around the district. Victor Sandoval and the tremendous team that he has put together uh, in that department have been making a lot of really great improvements to the sites around the district. And the quality of the work has been really very good. Uh, parents and staff at my site, Ohlone, have really been commenting frequently to me uh, how, on how pleased they are with what they see going on. Uh, the main topic of my comments is another district-wide process that has also results in making our schools and district even better, and that is the process of evaluation for employees. Uh, as administrators, we're currently fully engaged in this process with our classified staff, and uh, evaluation, of course, being a fully confidential matter. Uh, the specifics are not talked about outside of our one-on-one -on -one meetings with our employees. Uh, these discussions, though, do result in specific improvements in individual and class performance. Uh, but there's another aspect to evaluation that I want to talk about. Another aspect of these evaluation meetings is not generally recognized, and it stems from the fact that the great majority of our employees at PVSD and our schools are really very much committed to their work. They're very hardworking. And they do great things at our schools every single day. Uh, in this context, the evaluation process is one of the ways in which we as administrators and managers 
recognize and express our gratitude for the really great work our people are doing every single day. And through this, uh, this kind of recognition, our employees' feelings of pride and meaning are bolstered. And all of our commitment to our team, our grade level teams, our school team, our department teams is strengthened and deepened. And for very many of our employees, the evaluation process confirms that uh, we are, they are valued members of a great team and our commitment to our work is thereby reinforced. And as administrators, we get uh, satisfaction when we help a specific employee improve their, uh, make improvements to her or his um, practice, but our sense of pride and confidence in our teams are confirmed and strengthened as well when we get to formally recognize the really good work that our fellow staff members are doing. Um, so evaluation is also another way we build team strength. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have anyone from CWA? Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to action items. Uh, 10.1 is uh, resolution 171829 um, on child ab abuse prevention month. And this is a report by Suzanne Smith. Come on up, Suzanne. Hi. Hi. President DeRose, um, Superintendent Rodriguez, board members, thank you for considering this resolution. Pajaro Valley Unified School District, resolution number 171829, declaring support for April as National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Whereas child safety is of the utmost importance, and whereas child abuse and neglect is an important soci social concern that may affect the long-term health and well-being of not only the children, but also the adults they become, and whereas safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and communities can break the cycle of abuse and maltreatment, and whereas child abuse prevention requires a coordinated and comprehensive response by all systems supporting children, youth and families, for example, schools, law enforcement, health systems, faith-based organizations, and community programs. And whereas everyone has a stake in ensuring that children have access to the resources and supports they need to be safe, healthy, and successful. And whereas suspected child abuse or neglect must immediately be reported to appropriate law enforcement authorities. And whereas we have identified child safety and family services to be a priority and hereby declare April as a Child Abuse Prevention Month. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any speakers to this item? Um, do we have any comments or questions from the board? Trustee oh. Yarrow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne, once a child is identified as being abused, do we have a system in place that works immediately to help? What And perhaps, uh, the President, uh, what I'd like to do is to see if we can agendize and this you know, in the future and, and have a review of what our process is so that we all understand and, and know exactly what we have to do. This is this is not an action item tonight. I just wanted to bring it this is, up it for. Is, it is an action item. Oh. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, well, so I can ask now, right? Yeah, you can. So the answer, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, as soon as we suspect any uh, mandated reporter suspects that there is child abuse, we automatically would uh, call Child Protective Services, and they would begin the investigation. Is there is is there uh, data to? indicate uh, approximately the number of children that are that are in the system now that yes i'm sure there is and hmm? i could help find that i could I, there is that data i don't have it um necessarily but i could find it for you and get okay. that and information to you community? yes district wide I, you know i don't want any names or anything like that i right, just it want would, it would depend on what we can do and, and based on confidentiality right 
Okay. So those numbers are available from the Department of Child Welfare. It's just how many calls do they get from these area codes. I mean, they can pinpoint the data. How many yeah. are substantiated, unsubstantiated, or unfounded? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what I would be uh, uh, curious to uh, know, for instance, Minty White and E.A. Hall serve about the same families. So if we have, a, we have a child at Minty White, you know, in the elementary school level, does that do the siblings from that family receive the same kind of treatment? Is there a way that we can uh, streamline the counseling and the services that are provided? Again, once we, the, as mandated reporters, we reported to CPS, it is all confidential. And so um, certain things we wouldn't be able to address um, based on confidentiality. Right. So, so, so as we, as we set up the counseling services, for instance, um, could we think more in terms of both of those schools combined for the services instead of, you know, the services for the, for the siblings at EA Hall for, and then separately for the elementary school siblings? I don't, I don't know if I, if I'm really explaining that, but. Well, we do have counseling services at all three of those schools that are that is available to those students and to any students that have referrals that are made. Um, if we are not able to deal with it at the site level, they are referred to outside resources for counseling services. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Just um, for uh, the public to know that all school um, staff as well as the board has to go through mandated reporter training every year um, it's a, I think it's about a 30 minute video training that we do and we are all mandated reporters so if there are any signs that uh, raise red flags for us um, and they tell us what to look for we are mandated to report it um, so re the numbers reported um, may not be all substantiated but um, it's just to let CPS know that, you know, we feel like I've never had to do it. I don't know if any other board member has had to, but we do have that responsibility as, as board members and um, staff too. So anyway, um, having said that, um, I am in full support of recognizing um, uh, this resolution to make the community aware. And um, this is in recognition of um, April as child, I want to say it right, Abuse Prevention Month. So, uh, so I was just going to ask. Yes. So I was just going to ask: Are the, is this resolution sent anywhere? Is it go to someplace besides here? Um. Yes, resolutions do get. I'll let Michelle. So all resolutions, several months back, one question that was asked is what happens after resolution. So what we've been doing is after each time that we have a resolution that has a, a specific time frame, we provide you those updates on what the activities were and how we disseminated it out. So Alicia, even prior to her current position, would send it out to all staff, and then we'd make sure that the coordinated staff was aware of it. I think um, for us, really, this resolution really is focusing not only on our, our current staff, like our social emotional counselors, but also our partners like PVPSA. So just going to Willie's question, right? Um, one thing that happens is with PVPSA, they not only do individual counseling,
Resolutions will be providing you updates on what happened. Okay, um, does somebody, um, would someone uh, like to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to support Child Abuse Prevention Month by issuing this resolution. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'll, um, motion passes 601. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. And um, we have another board resolution. And this is. Um, I'll be doing it. Nancy is not here today. I'm sorry? And Nancy's not here today. Who will be so doing it? So I will it? be doing okay. it. So Dr. Rodriguez will be um, giving this report. And this is in uh, recognition of um, adult education. Yes. So the week right after we come back, um, then adult education will be recognized throughout the state of California. And so we are, I will say that we have a very unique and um, and strong adult education program here in this school district that um, that many do not have, as well as we span um, multiple cities. And so um, I was just going to read a few things um, in which I think highlight the resolution. And as I had mentioned before, um, the Adult Education Center does a lot of things in order to recognize their staff, and we'll do a listing of what occurred. Um, but it has, whereas um, Watsonville Aptos Santa Cruz Adult Education is the primary community resource for teaching and instruction of adult literacy that provides a way for adults to complete high school studies on their own time and pace and provides career and technical education and job training for adults seeking career changes or enhancements, and provides instruction for parents and families ranging from parent cooperative preschool classes through a wide spectrum of adult education courses, and provides programs especially designed for our adult learner and disabled population. And so, um, you know, I visit all the sites um, throughout the year and as well as um, a visit adult education and sometimes I think um, we don't realize the impact that these programs actually have on our community and on our family so for example some people may think um, why would they have um, cake decoration and why would they have something like that um, but I went in and saw the ladies and and the gentlemen um, preparing the cakes and each one of them said that through that opportunity they now have a job at a local bakery and that local bakery job is um, helping to support their family and their family's needs that wouldn't be taken care of if they didn't have that job and I think just the pride in their faces of um, having that and showing their own children that we never stop learning and we never stop growing um, really pr was a source of pride for themselves and their family. So I appreciate the work that our adult education um, does. And I ask for us to pass the resolution. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Karen? Well, I just want to say there was a, I, I can't seem to pop it up. I don't know why it won't pop up, but there was some place in there where you talked about um, what um, the programs do for job training and in there you said it provides them no I don't have it right on me because I for, for some reason it won't go to it I don't know why um, but it, it, it I wanted it to say that it provides jobs because you had it and it said you provided I forgot what it says what does it say on the job thing <laughs> For, for the career for the classes that you do for you know pharmacy tech and blah 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 it so provides know. career and tech education and job yeah. training for adults seeking career changes or enhancements okay career <laughs> changes or enhancement I would say for career change jobs I mean it should just say jobs I was just thinking career well, enhancements no they do, I mean most of the people that are taking those classes they they are taking those classes in order to get a job <laughs> out into the community you know what I'm saying they're not trying to enhance their already career that they already have and a lot of times they're trying to actually but you know. there are some enhancements no I know but I'm just saying it needs to say programs. but it needs to say um, career changes enhancements and jobs or job <laughs> opportunities jobs yeah, opportunity or something if like that if they do that it, yeah, I, I just, wanted just wanted to say it, I don't mind what it says it just it just says career enhancement 
and and uh, career changes and career placements or something or jobs or something. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. But then we won't pass it tonight, can we? But yeah, no, I want to pass it with a revision. Next week. It's next week. Yeah. Hmm? No, I want to pass it. I want to pass it. I just want to ask <laughs> after you pass, after we pass it, you can do a little revision. <laughs> That's all. That's all I'm asking. So I'm, 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 I'm um, supporting the week of adult education, asking us to vote for this week of adult education, the resolution. I'm, I'm asking to do that. Um, you know, not so long ago, we um, were talking on this board about shutting down adult education because of our um, budget problems. I don't remember that. Yeah, that was like my first and second year on the board. And um, as a board, we um, stood committed to continuing adult education because of the importance of in the community. Um, I was fighting for it, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. We weren't huh. sure. The money has been very uncertain about whether it was going to come or not come and in in what regard. And there had been um, some money saved that we had to sweep. and um, Swept a lot of their money. Yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say to Nancy and to her crew and to Todd and everybody over there, thank you for um, sticking with it. It's an important community um, support and service. I was there just today. I took one of my patients there, an 18-year-old girl who needs um, to finish her GED. And then I was really impressed with the teachers, the GED classes, the times that people could take. They could work all day and take GED classes in the afternoon from 4 to 8 at night. And it's just a really great program. And, all, and I have many, many, many friends who take the bird watching courses and some of the fun stuff too. So I'm really proud that we um, kept adult education and we continue to support it. So I'm in favor of the re resolution and I'd like to make a motion to pass the resolution. Okay, I'll ask for a second and then other comments. I'll second. Okay, any other comments? Okay, um, so I just want to say I'm a huge supporter of adult education as well. And um, they recently um, have have taken over the Santa Cruz adult education because of recent funding changes. Um, it's actually a consortium now that it is countywide. Every county has an adult education consortium and with its own board. And so there's been some major changes and changes can be scary. Um, even if it is good for the community, it's um, scary, but um, they've really come through this well, have expanded services and um, really expanded opportunities um, uh, within the program, um, the original program, as well as the um, newer programs that they have throughout um, Santa Cruz County. And I believe that's including San Lorenzo. Are they in San Lorenzo? Yeah, yeah. So really the whole county, it's huge. Um, they have done a really good job in um, um, making these changes and going with the flow. Uh, as we know, changes are hard. But um, I would um, like to um, offer my support for this too. And we do have a motion and a second, so I will go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 601. Congratulations to our adult ed. Okay. Um, item 10.3 is the second reading of the Lynn Scott Charter School renewal application. And uh, Principal Julie Wiley, welcome. Good evening. Thank you for having me back. So if you look at your charter um, document in your packet, element M is the only element that there have been changes to since we looked at it for the public hearing. Um, element M talks about employee return rights, and there was some concern that some of the language in there wasn't matching up with PVFT's contract and with some of the other things that are were a legal obligation. And so we were able to sit down and hash those out and come up with revisions that didn't change the meaning of, 
of the charter, but more clearly um, outlined how those return rights would happen. So that's the only revision that's occurred since the last time you looked at the document. That's on page 45. can I mention? Okay, go. Um, as was mentioned in the 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 item, we did staff did review all the required elements, and um, staff is recommending the approval of the petition. Okay. And any questions or comments from the board? I see Karen. <laughs> go ahead. Well, I just wanted to ask. Um, because I, th I thought it was actually considered Lynn Scott as a parent involvement kind of a school. That's what I thought it was. It is. That's the, that was what the charter was originally formed as. It started as a magnet school with parent participation being the magnet. And then when the Charter Schools Act passed in 1992, the group of parents who started it quickly submitted a petition to the board. And it is a parent participation school. However, in the last several years there have been court rulings that have indicated and have come down stating that schools cannot require charter schools cannot require parent participation that it's considered a form of payment because and so what? we've had i'm sorry a form of payment oh and so we've had to really alter our model and r really sort of approach it from a this is what you get when you come and volunteer at your kids school Oh. Um, it's it's important to us. It's important to you. It's important to your to your student to see you to see your face there to see you involved and to see you valuing their education. So we have had to make some adjustments in some of the policies um, as the law changes and as um, the charter environment and landscape starts to change. Some okay, because I was just wondering because I saw this part um, may encourage parent involvement, but she'll notify parents and guardians. Of, that parental involvement is not a requirement. That's now a requirement by law. We have to have that in the charter, and we have to, to we have to notify parents that they that we can no longer require that. Yeah. So that's that's you're giving me that information now, and so that I know it now. Mm -hmm. So because I was reading that, well, wow, I thought it was a parent petition. petition. It still is. Oh. We still have a, a pretty high level of parent participation, comparatively speaking. Is it like it was five years ago? No. Oh, okay. um, that which is unfortunate, but that's that's you know that's what happens when you can't mandate something. We can't use that word mandatory anymore. Okay. Um, so w we've continued to be able to have a really committed cadre of parents who want to volunteer and who really um, value being at the school with their children. And um, the staff has adjusted to that and is making good use of the volunteers that we do have. Okay, I get it. Okay. Any other comments, Willie? Just some uh, comments. Um, the um, the uh, review of Lynn Scott that we had at at the previous meeting was very good. Thank you. So it, it answered answered many of the um, concerns that I had. I'm uh, pleased to see that uh, Lynn Scott has reached out <coughs> in into the neighborhood to uh, bring in. Uh, kids from that area. Mm -hmm. uh, I I am I am concerned about the facilities itself. You know the buildings and so forth. And I I think that we need to kind of plan a little bit. If that uh, facility needs a larger setting or whatever. So I I'm uh, pleased with the school and I, and I'm, and I think it's a wonderful option for uh, families to uh, come. And I'm, uh, you know, pleased to make the motion tonight to accept the uh, recommendation of the superintendent. Well, I was, I was just gonna, okay. Oh, I was just going to ask really quickly. I know there's a plaque on there that you're one of the old school. You're one of the. You're considered. I, I forgot what it says on it, but it says it was. It, the building it was itself is an architectural historic. Yeah. It's not a monument. I don't know what they call it. It's a, you know, historically significant site. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have to be really careful about, you know, changing the paint or tipping the stairs or anything really? like that. Really? You can't. You have to do We're it because it's historical. Careful, you, yeah. can't, you can't. You can't. Oh, I mean, the, that main building, you can't really touch it, right? The main well, building. It, it needs to be touched, but. I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. Does it say the year? I forget. It does say something I like the year. I don't know. Huh? What is it? Yeah. See, my posse. They're here again. 1929. 
Okay, maybe okay. I don't know. I can't remember. It's late. Nineteen twenty. Well, anyway, it's pretty old. <laughs> like to make the second. Okay, Karen? second. Okay, so we have um, a motion by Trustee Hero and a second by Karen. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes six zero one. Congratulations. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next item is uh, also a re report by Dr. Rodriguez on Raptor Technologies pilot program. Yeah. So just so that you know, um, the illness is going around the district office, so it has even hit me for the first time in three years. I'm, I'm under the weather, but um, that's why people haven't been here to present their items because um, we have a lot of staff that's out sick right at this moment. Um, so I'm presenting for this. So I did, um, because of some of the questions that had come up, I did um, wake Sheila up today um, to have a conversation with her of, of of where um, the the root of this program came for I will say that I have in my previous district we did have the Raptor system but for once it actually didn't come from me um, so as we had mentioned um, in December we had Keenan and Associates for the first time in about five years go out and do an evaluation of the site so that happened during the months of December and January um, <clears throat> we did that because we wanted to know where our liabilities were and where some of the concerns were in terms of facilities and everything. So one thing when they did, they did a portion of them when school was in session and they did a portion of them when school was out of session. So some schools saw them um, and saw them coming through and some didn't. It's according to which one it was. Um, but basically what Keenan Associates found was that there was an inconsistent process for how parents got on campus. And so that was definitely an area of liability. So what Sheila did is she's part of a safety roundtable, um, which is basically a list server group where you can put out concerns and questions and say, what are you all doing about it? So people that are like people like her, um, of her same role, are part of this email string. And so um, because they have about, they service about, um, they service about 120,000 schools in about um, 12,000, um, I'm sorry, 1,200 school districts throughout the state of California. Um, Raptor came up as a possibility. So they're really one of the top people or companies that is helping with this concern. So as has been, as I had mentioned before, um, I'm very big on pilot to scale, right? So we don't want to do anything just as a full blush, but we do it in little bit, bits so that we find out, do we really want to do it? And then we also find out, um, is it going to work for us? right because it might work for another school district but does it work for our school district um, so we had a conversation with principals we wanted to find two very diverse um, pilot schools so we have one that's Valencia which is in the northern zone um, has um, does have a significant set of parents that are um, that are from Watsonville as well but it is in the northern zone and then we found we did Hall District so two different counties because remember Hall District is actually a Monterey County and really servicing fairly diverse um, parent populations um, there has been some concern about um, well what about our undocumented workers um, and our what undocumented parents um, issues with immigration and where does all that information go and what happens if they don't have identification so I did talk to Sheila today and then I also um, because I was the one that was going to be speaking to it I called um, our rep for um, Raptor myself this afternoon just to confirm the information to make sure that I didn't misquote and so basically what we asked for the parent um, to pass through the system is their first name their last name and their birth date so what they were what they are 
are showing is that um, we actually have more information on our student information system than we are at than we're uploading into the system. Um, they do put they do take the first name, the last name, and the birth date, and they put it towards the National Registry of Sex Offenders. That is from all 50 states to identify whether or not um, that parent um, or that person has any sexual. Um, um, sexual misdemeanors um, or felonies on their record. Um, that information stays within the system. Part of what they do is they, they will never sell that information or send off that information anywhere. Um, a parent doesn't have to have a California or a state, um, state right, um, identification. They do have to have some form of identification that was issued from anywhere from Mexico to a different um, different city or different um, country. And um, so what we're asking is we, it's a fairly inexpensive um, in that it's $1,700 um, per site. So it would cost us $3,400 um, to do this pilot. But we're wanting to do this pilot at those two schools um, for the rest of this year, see how it goes. We'll evaluate, does it minimize parent participation? What are the negative uh, impacts of that? Um, I will say, and I, that's why, um, I, I will say that in Santa Ana, it did. Um, it's not to be hysterical, but it did. We did find people that shouldn't be on our campus that were trying to enter into the campus. Um, and so I'm not saying that those people had malintent, but they they were sex offenders, and we were able to say to them, unfortunately, um, you can't come on campus. Um, so we're asking that we do the pilot. Um, I, in, I've tried to be very transparent on the systems that I'm bringing in. As I've mentioned to some of you during my one-on-ones, because of the dollar amount, we could have just done it. We didn't, we don't, that's not the way that we work now. Um, within the school district, we bring it to the board so that you're aware because there's implications of with parents and, and all that. Um, but we do place the security of our students as our number one. Um, we'll bring it back to the board. You're not approving that all um, schools do it at this time. You're just approving that we do it at the two schools um, so that we see how it goes. And if it doesn't work, um, then we, of course, um, won't move forward. But um, we do, there are 1,200 school districts in, the, in California alone that are using it, um, that are um, making sure that our vulnerabilities are decreased um, and so we're asking for your approval. Okay. Um, no speakers to this item? Okay. Um, questions, comments from the board? A question. Ed Willie. Thank you. Uh, somebody sent me an email today uh, regarding this item, and there were, there, were, there were two concerns. One was that the person felt we already have the system in place. We already have uh, people doing this checking and your response is no we, we we do not we do have a well it's it's inconsistent in that some school sites do make you sign in we absolutely do not at any of our schools check the national registry of sex offenders we do not do that and the the one good thing is that it produces a badge for you that then when you're walking around the school um, people know that you have gone through um, have gone through the office um, some do have those stickers, but we absolutely do not um, check national registry of sex offenders at this point. We do not. Would, would, it, would it be uh, safe, safe to assume, uh, Michelle, that in a school situation like Watsonville High School, which is open campus and right, uh, right downtown where we have a lot of people walking on and off the campus versus Aptos High School, which is really well placed, I think, because it's more isolated and it would be more effective in a downtown situation where, where, where you have a lot of flow of people that you don't know. So, uh, so, so the object still is that people still have to go to the office and still sign in and do all of the, you know, to, uh, to actually get checked out. Is that... 
Yeah, so that would be in the best of all worlds. I will say that um, at this current time, we have very open campuses, and people are frequently walking around even our elementary sites without having checked in. And so this is part of having people know that if I see you, if I'm a staff member and I see you and I don't see you with a badge, I should say to you, hey, please um, go to go to the office and sign in for me. Um, many of our campuses are very vulnerable at this time. The question also is, is, for instance, in some school districts, they just focus this program at the elementary level. They don't do it at the high school level. Um, sometimes it's because there's an assumption that if you are older that you have the ability to speak up if something is happening. Um, if we know predator behavior, we know that's not always true, right? Because they generally, um, <coughs> well, they generally convince you of doing something that's a negative so that then they have something over you, right? Um, but, um, so that, so the, Basically, the uh, service service that we're going to purchase or use here mm -hmm. is not actually being done now at the school site. Not yet. No, we would be doing it at Hall District in Valencia as a pilot. No, it's no, not it, without oh. without this with with our with our human people doing this right now. With they no. would they would uh, phone in and they would register people now without the system? So it, it's it's inconsistent. So some of them, like if you go to new school, um, they make even me sign in. Um, and so she's really dedicated to sign in, sign out. Um, but most do not. Um, it's, it's varying levels of degree of whether or not they make you sign in. No matter what, if they do make you sign in, it's just that you're signing your name. It has nothing to do with checking um, anything about you it's just knowing that you're on campus okay the the uh, the second uh, point of that email today was the uh, cost mm -hmm. I think it mentioned like a fifty thousand dollars or something like that was that so that that, that, that comes off yeah, so that comes from if we were to do it at all 32 of our schools oh, okay. so that that came from the uh, the medium which the question was how, what would it cost as a one-time cost if we did it in each and every school? And I so see. that would be approximately $50,000. That's not what we're doing tonight. Okay. Um, what we're doing tonight is um, $3,500. Good. Okay. I just wanted to go on record and to answer that yeah. email. Sure. Public. Okay. Go ahead, Georgia. Um, so I just have a couple of questions for you. With regards to this badge that you're saying that the person checking in would receive, mm -hmm. um, when they leave the campus, do they get to keep that badge? Do they have to turn it in? And when they return to the campus at a later date, do they have to re-go through this process? Because a person's status could change. Mm -hmm. So um, there are two things. One, it has a date on it. Um, so technically, if they were sneaky, um, they could, they could w wear it. They are going to wear it off. Um, then they could br come back and... Um, reuse it, I guess, if they took it on and off their clothes. So they could technically use it. Um, there are, and this actually specially would be used um, for regular volunteers. Most of the time, it's you do it for the, fir for the first time in a year. So let's say you have a parent that comes every Wednesday. Um, they would do it once, and most of the time they do some permanent badges for them so that what you will wind up seeing, especially for the younger grades, is you'll see parents come in and be able to take their, their name that has their picture and not have to go through the process. You'd have them do it every year, but you wouldn't have them do it daily now for or weekly. For parents that it's more like every three months, like I come and then I'm not going to come back for another six months, then you would have them do it again in the six months. But if they're a weekly or daily parent that supports that, they wouldn't have to go through the system daily. 
Um, and that's something that um, we actually had some issues with in Santa Ana because we had some schools that had high, high levels of parent participation. And so there was a line out the door for parents that were trying to get into the school. And um, so what we did is we did those, those badges for them so that they didn't have to do it on a daily basis. I'm just, I, I, I don't know, maybe just doing that on an annual basis is just a little concerning that that might be too long of a lapse. I mean, is that possible to, I, I'm hearing what you're saying. We don't want to dousing parents that are giving of their time and coming to the schools on a weekly basis, but not necessarily doing it maybe to them every time they come in or even weekly, but maybe some medium check True. or something, maybe every semester. Exact, that may be good. Um, my other on, other concern on this is that since we're taking the, we'd be taking this on now and we're going to spring break, we have effectively two months roughly left of school. Do you really feel, in your judgment, that that's enough time to ef run an effective pilot study program? I mean, because I'm sure there would be other options that we could look at continuing the pilot study into maybe the, through the beginning of next semester. Be well, yeah. So what are your thoughts with the, the two months? Yeah. So I think generally, because I've gone through the implementation of this program, generally you find out all the bad kinks within the first week most of the time. But that's the beauty of the pilot is we get to choose, right? So when it's June and it's the end of school, we'll ask the principals and say, do you think that you have a good grasp on it? Um, if they say no, then we can continue it on. I mean, all of these are self-imposed timelines, right? So we can, in June, say we're not ready to decide if we're going to expand it. Let's take it into the next school year, and we're not going to decide until December, right? Because um, it's, it's completely based on how we feel. It also would be based on the number of problems that we have with it. So if we have a lot of concerns go coming out of it, then we'll slow it way down, right? Um, so it's all based on just how, how the pilots are going. Okay, so, when, so since the school year will inevitably end in June, mm -hmm. when will you be thinking you'll be bringing that report back to this board, like in the June, July... Yeah, so, well, it depends, on, it depends on what it is. So if we feel like we need to continue forward, we'll probably just inform the board that we're going to continue the pilot for a couple more months, and we won't bring it as an open session item. If we feel like we have a good handle on it, we'll probably bring it back in July and say, this is our suggestion to implement it at the elementary schools or to implement it in this zone or something. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, anybody? Yeah. Um, how often are we checking um, on our teaching and staff's backgrounds? I know when they come into the schools, when they're first hired, we trust line them or whatever, but how often are we actually checking? Or, is, or if, if they get arrested for something that is automatically triggers something at the state level and we find out about it? I think that's how it works, right? Pam's shaking her head yes behind you, Jonah. Well, go ahead, Jonah, if you know. Um, usually, um, if, if uh, we, we will get something from the county um, if there is a, a, a trigger. Um, like, for example, CTC will also send something to the county if um, some credentials are going to be suspended or revoked, so we will, we, we will get that information that way for teachers. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I don't really, I'm not really in support of this, honestly. I mean, I don't really see, like, sex offenders on our campus as a big problem that we, do we, do we know we've had sex offenders on our campuses that happen to be parents or people walking in that we need to protect our kids against? I mean, our kids have certificated staff with them at all times. There's, I don't understand why we're, we, this is like something that needs to be checked on all the time. I mean, I'm more scared of people going on campus with a gun than I am, yeah. you know, a sex offender at this point. I mean, I, I mean, I'm more concerned for the behavior of our own staff than I, I sort of am with parents going in and out of the schools. So I just, I guess I don't understand the need to, to put this in. 
Well, the point is, is we don't know because we haven't been checking. I think just the fact that people have to give their ID and show that they're on campus. Um, and, you know, we had a, a conversation previously about it's, it's also to track who's on campus because right now if we were to have a natural disaster, we don't even know who is on campus currently. Right? We wouldn't have a listing that says who's on campus because we have so many people on campus um, that we don't know. Um, and so, you know, we're one thing that we've been asked of the board is to look at where our, um, where are we fragile in terms of risk and safety. So one area that we've been deemed at being um, having liabilities is in terms of people being able to go on and off our campus. I guess one of the things I'm really concerned with are, are numbers of undocumented parents and the, and the data that is collected on them. And would our school district ever be forced to turn it over to the Department of Education or something? I mean, it, it does, I think, um, I'm worried about that. But it's, there isn't any addresses, social security numbers, or identification numbers. It's just their first, their last name, and their birth date. So the enforcement of this. So what if, what, what if a dad, you know, when he was 18, got arrested for, you know, having a sexual something, and then his name came back as being on the DOJ list. Then who does the enforcement? And then did he, if he's not a registrant, then we, are we, do we turning him over then to the authorities? I mean, like how far does it go? We just don't allow them to be on campus. So that's it? This, the principal just sits down with the dad and says, sorry, you can't come on campus? Or what happens? Yep, just says you can't come on campus. You so came the up. DOJ doesn't get notified? We're checking with them. So who... It, we're not checking on whether or not they're complying with with it. What we're checking on is whether or not they're a, a known felon if they have a sexual crime in their background. That's only a sexual crime. So the people that are arrested for a number of different things just, that maybe they've they've adjudicated their their stuff, including sometimes people with very low level sex offenses, um, they've adjudicated their penalty or whatever, and, and they're free to walk among us. So, the, we're, I mean, where do, where do we draw the line? It's, if they are on the National Registry of Sex Offenders, they will come up. If they're not on that National Registry, then they won't. So we have a Megan's Law registration that every one of us can go on a website and take a look at. And, it's, and everybody should because it's unbelievable that your neighbors and your, in your neighborhoods, you can see where everybody lives and what they've done, essentially. Um, you can see what they were convicted of. So... We already have that access to do that. So I guess I just, but we I think we have bigger it. fish to fry is what I'm saying. And I feel like as a parent going on campus, to have to stop and, sh I don't know. I'm, I'm worried about where the data is going to go. And I'm worried about that our parents are going to, like if, if I wanted to just go run in really quick and drop a lunch off to my kid and I'm like left work to do this and it's pouring rain, like now I got to stop and check in and I don't know. I just don't think parents are going to like it. And I'm worried about our undocumented parents not even wanting to, to step foot on campus as a result of this. So I, I'm not going to support this tonight. Okay. Jeff? Yeah, I can understand I the concerns of... Um, of Trustee Disturpa because there is some issues around. I can understand we're trying to encourage our parents to have parental involvement, and yet this seems like it's another um, wall between us and them. But you know, let's take two things. Let's take this into account. It's a pilot. We're going to try it out. Let's see how it goes. I I, I also agree with um, Trustee Acosta. Two months seems a little bit short to me especially as we talk about spring break and all that's coming up. But you know what? If we can protect, and I know Kim agrees with me on this one, if we can protect one kid, th that's really important too. And I, I, we haven't had incidents yet, but we need to look at our, our, where, where we're vulnerable and to shore up that. Again, I'm not saying we roll it out across the district, but let's try it out. If it doesn't work, we tried. But what if it does work? What if we, really, what if we are able to do something really positive here? Then if, to me, it's worth it. I, you know, I have kids in the district. I walked onto Real Damar the other day. I was stopped, and said, "My wife's a teacher at Real Damar. 
I was stopped and said, you need to go back to the office and put a badge on. I think, that's just, I think that's the, that is the culture we need to build, and this is part of that process and part of that culture. I'm in 100% in support of this. I want to see where this takes us. I hope it's useless and we don't have to use it. But if it protects one kid, I'll write that check. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so I, I want to agree with what every almost everybody said here. I have some concerns, too, and some questions. And I did get those emails um, from a couple of parents today. Um, one of the um, items that they brought up is um, we don't need it, which to me, like you said, we don't know if we need it. Um, I would rather be proactive than find out, oh my gosh, we let someone on campus that now has hurt a child. And for me, it's not, not about liability and litigate, you know, potential litigation. It's about student safety is where um, it starts for me. And I would much rather be proactive. Um, they also said, and Willie had mentioned this, that um, the staff can do this themselves. I, I couldn't imagine staff time of, I think it's actually a handwritten form, because we do live scans, right? A handwritten form that is sent to the Department of Justice. It's not, an, it takes a week, basically. Which brings me to my next question, my first question, I guess. Um, how long does this process take? I actually wish there was someone here from Raptor because there's questions I'm pretty sure you won't be able to answer that I have coming up. But someone walks in, they give their name, their date, their birth name and birth date. How long does it, it take for that information to come? Back so, here or not. so I've seen it in person, um, and generally it takes about, well, so it depends. If they have a ID that has the scan on it, meaning the scan and they can swipe it, it takes about 45 seconds. <coughs> if they have to hand input it in, then it takes about two minutes. Okay. Um, you but have that mentioned is per, per, per person. Okay. So that's the check-in. And then you had mentioned something about what if there's a natural disaster, we want to know who's on campus. Mm -hmm. um, when they leave, <coughs> do they actually check out? They're supposed to, yes. They are, okay. Um, Which I'm not good at doing that, by the way. Well, no one's so we <coughs> had, you had also mentioned that when a teacher is hired, they have to go through the background check. Um, you said teachers specifically. Do s staff doesn't all, have all to? staff? All staff. Okay. Um, all staff have to be fingerprinted. Okay. So I think the beginning of the school year is really important for us to pilot this because that's when you get your influx of volunteers. That's when you're going to get new volunteers, um, which means we'll get more feedback from from parents and community <coughs> on whether you know, this, it's a positive reaction or negative. So I think we can get more data that way. Um, in regards to name and birth date, if they're gonna give that name and birth date, it leaves lots of room for error in my mind. There's gonna be a lot of Joe Millers born on December 3rd, 1964 or whatever. It, it's gonna happen a lot, so I'm, one, this is one of the questions why I wish somebody was here from what is their, um, you know, rate of error and what do you do in that case? Are we going to open ourselves to litigation, you know, because someone's name comes up and it's not really them and now we've defamed them? So I would just like to ask that question and see how, what do they, what do they have in place to deal with that? when it happens, because I can imagine it happening. Um, I do have the same concerns that Kim brought up with the data. Um, even if you're only putting in a name and a birth date, that is going to the federal government. If they know where that data is coming from, or is there a way that the federal government, certain 
areas in federal government, is there a way for them to look at that data and figure out if they are legal or not legal? And are they going to use that, that data to come after our community? Because I, nothing would surprise <laughs> me at this point. I think that, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it out loud. It's really, really scary to me. And it's, I, I mean, I think the concept is great, but where we are right now in this climate, I think it could be really scary. I mean, our parents are scared right now. Our community is really scared. And if we're asking them for information that we're going to put in a federal government database, I could just see that being a real problem. So I'm okay with the pilot, but that's the kind of feedback I want. And I'm glad that there's a school on both ends of the spectrum because um, I really, really want to get that information from parents. If they're so, okay. I'm sorry, Leslie. Oh, I'm almost done. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, I mean, if they're okay with it and they see that the value outweighs the risk in their minds, then I would want to know that. Um, how long or how often would you repeat that process? Would that be up to the site or the district? The district. Okay. Okay. Uh, Les, can, I'd like to Go say ahead, one more Kim, thing. So many, many states, and including California, have changed the laws recently. And um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact laws because they essentially are going into effect and titrated isn't the right word, but over a series of years. And it's specifically um, directed at people with low-level sex crimes that have um, historically had to register as sex offenders. Um, many of those people were like, um, they had consensual sex with, maybe they were 18 and they had sex with their girlfriend who was 16 and her parents prosecuted. And, you know, 20 years ago they were convicted of that and forced to register as a sex offender when that really is not somebody. But that's somebody who would be precluded under, the, under this system of going onto the campus. So in those types of cases, there were, their, um, their, adjudication or whatever as a sex, uh, as, a, as a registrant is going to be changed. They can petition the court and change that. And so then that's happening across our nation and including here in California. So that's, the, that's also something that I worry about because if we have parents who might have that type of a record who are, are not going to have to register anymore um, in a few years, I, I just think that this, I, I just think that this is not the way to go about providing safety on our campus. That's all. Willie. Thank you. Um, we ask our we ask our kids to um, um, if you if you say something, say something. You know that's the that's the ultimate safety thing to me. And if you see an adult walking around the campus that doesn't have a badge, say something because that person doesn't belong there should go down the office and sign in you know you guys don't understand how many people we have walking through the watsonville campuses just walking through because it's a shortcut between even even if we build the fences we get people wandering through if you see something say something and that person does not belong on our school grounds for the safety of not only the teachers but the students so so after Thinking about this, I I, uh, I uh, support Jeff's idea. Let's try this out. Let's let's uh, let's see what happens here. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, George. Uh, because now that having to get to listen, and I am I'm really um, hearing what Kim is saying, and I'm extremely concerned, and especially concerned um, for Trustee Osmondson because you're talking about Hall School. And so this is this could potentially preclude a lot of parents. I could see, especially in the south end, um, where the three of us majority sit, from wanting to go on campuses or just being afraid and inhibited. And th that's concerning to me when we're we're trying to you know be an inclusive environment and bring parents in and encourage them to do that. And so many steps have been taken with like the TBT, the TB testing and whatnot. I think this is like, you know, when we step that far forward, this is like almost a step back. And, and I do hear concern. 
student safety, yeah, that has got to be a top priority. But as Kim mentioned, there's so many other things besides a potential sex offender on a campus for student safety. So if when I heard you say, we don't have an SOP in place across the board for all 32 schools, whether you're a charter school, elementary, junior high, or a traditional high school, in place for people coming on that campus, maybe that should be the starting point that we need to have an SOP in place for all school sites, that somehow people have got to come through that front office, meet with the secretary, the receptionist, whoever is at the helm of that, and be checked in, and they've got to be checked out. Maybe that would be somewhere we could start. Um, that's far less invasive to our parents, and we could see how that rolls out and the effectiveness of that and evaluate that a few months down the road. And, and, and I know that'll be tough, but, you know, you know, <laughs> maybe we could start it at the elementary and build it up. But I think we should have definitely an SOP in place for all of our 32 schools for anybody coming on campus, whether it's an administrator, a trustee, a parent, a vendor, you name it. I'm yet to hear something I disagree with tonight on this subject, but I go back to this is a pilot program, and let's try it out. 1,200 school districts, is that, am I correct in my, my statistics, are looking at this. 1,200 school districts are using, are it? using it, excuse me. We, we want to encourage our parents, and I agree with you. We have to really look, get some hard questions. But let's try it out. If we don't like it, if it doesn't work for us, if there's more questions that come from this, that's OK. It's OK to ask the questions. But we're not going to know until we try. And we're looking at a budget. How much does it cost us? $3,000? 3000 Or the, the pilot? The pilot. $3,400. That is not, unfortunately, we've spent a lot more money than that. Um, at a, at a very, at a, at a meeting. I, I'm sorry, I, I understand everyone's concerns. I think it's really impressive, frankly, that everybody is so concerned and really talking about that. Let's try it out, let's see how it goes. Let's have a report back in July and let's, we'll hear from the schools and then we go from there. It's not a, it's not a, lifetime, com it's not a lifetime commitment. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, so I am in support of moving forward with the pilot, however, I'm, um, I would really stress that really good communication goes out to the parents and families of those schools before it happens. Um, let, them, let them know what's coming, what it's about. They have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, make sure they know it's a pilot. I just think the communication on this is going to make it or break it with the parents. And then just one other quick thing that I... I had noticed, I looked up their website several times today, and I was looking for, um, where does it say, um, for reviews from customers. I wanted to hear what parent feedback was. All that's on there is about what great tech support they have. There's not one review from a parent saying, this is great, I feel like my school is safe. So. Just a heads up, and that was going to be, again, a question if they were here. But I'm okay with the pilot. Those are just some concerns, and I would want, if we decide this is great and we want to move forward or at least start talking about next steps, I would want some of those questions answered. And I agree with Jeff. I don't disagree with anybody, with anybody's concerns up here, and I think that's kind of um, I have an, uh, one more question. Do we know who um, who has access to the information and how will it be dealt with in a confidential and sensitive manner? So it, they maintain it within their own system and then it's deleted after three years. But so like when your principal has to sit down with a family member and say, sorry, you can't come on campus anymore. Like, is she the only person or he the only person that's going to know it's, that? It's the person who's running the screening that will see it. And they don't see specifics. They just see that the person has been tagged. They don't see what it says. It's just like with I anything that's, so it's, it is public access information, right? So it's exactly what you would see before. You would be able to see that the person has come up um, and it would, it would tell you that they're not allowed on campus. So I've 
personally seen a parent turned away. It's not, um, there isn't a defamation of character because you're just basically telling the parent, unfortunately, you're coming up. And generally, as soon as you say that, they'll tell you um, what it is. But you're not giving them a lot of information other than just saying that you're not, they're not supposed to be, they can't come on campus. Okay, but I, what I guess I'm concerned about is like uh, parents talk, mm -hmm. right? So if they see that happening out loud in front of the front desk or whatever, like that isn't a good plan either. Okay, well, we so can. I don't know who's doing that screening, and that person needs to be s probably sworn to confidentiality. Like it needs to be somebody that's not going to be like whispering and telling like an entire community. Well, it's going to be your office manager or your office assistant that's going to do it. I will tell you now, we're not going to be able to have the principal and the assistant principal right? being the only ones to run it because that's just not feasible. You can't have the principal stuck in the office. So it's going to be the office manager or the office assistant. Okay, so um, concerns noted for sure. Um, okay, so not sure where this is going to go, but if somebody would like to make a motion to approve the pilot. I will make a motion. Oh. I will make a motion to approve the pilot. And is there a second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. So that's 3-3. Three, three. So it dies. Okay. So um, to George's point, um, can we look at uh, alternatives, whether it's an alter outside vendor or um, recommendation, what other districts do uh, with internal processes of um, having a consistent method of check-in? Okay. All right, Chicken thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have quite a bit to go. Um, this next one um, is another safety item, um, which I'm very happy with. This is the Child Safety Alert System. And um, is this Catherine? Come on up, Catherine. I don't think I've met you yet, have I? Is this on? Don't make yes. me feel bad if I forgot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and Board of Trustees. This is, um, yes, the Child Safety Law. It's SB 1072. Um, State Senate bill was passed into um, law becoming the Poly Safety um, School Bus Law. Um, and what that requires is that all of our school buses be equipped with um, a, an alert at the rear of the bus, so at the end of each run, the driver would be required to walk the entire interior of the bus um, looking for students who are left behind and then disarming the alarm at the rear of the bus before coming back up. Um, we've actually had this process in place since I came in January of 2016, but they're using their handheld stop sign um, to put in the back window just to show us that they've walked it. Um, but this will actually come with um, the horn will honk, the lights will flash, it will have real-time texts and emails to those people who need to be notified if the driver does in fact park the bus and get out and leave a child on it without performing the um, safety inspection. Or not leave a child and just not perform the safety inspection, right? Right. Hopefully there's no child involved, but... Right, <laughs> yes. Um, the other thing that comes with this law, which... Um, for me is an easier thing is that it takes away our responsibility of disciplining or um, terminating employment for this because the DMV and the CHP will just revoke their license um, if they in fact are reported. Uh, if they do leave a student on the bus, we have five days to report to them that, that they left a student and then the DMV and the CHP will come in and take care of it for us. So. Oh. <laughs> So that's nice. Um, but we do, um, so the bill was passed in September of 2016. Um, regulations had to be adopted by January of 2018. And now we have to be in compliance by the start of the school year of the 1819 um, school year. So I'm here to seek approval for this so that we can get it scheduled over the summer and be in compliance when we're supposed to. 
Okay. Do we have speakers to this item? Do not. All right. Um, <coughs> any board comments, questions? No. Incident like that. We've had an incident already. By looking at this, we don't meet we that. Don't. Uh, we are exactly who is not going to meet the exceptions. Right. That's what I, that I was yeah. getting. Um, my next other question to this with regards to the quote, um, was this put out as a publicly bidded contract, this quote? That we have back, this contract of a quote. So I don't believe that's true. We believe we went with Zonar. They've paired up with Child Checkmate, and it's an existing system that we already have. So we did not go out to bid. That would be my only one point of concern with this. With the, with the dollar amount for this and that it was not put out to a public bid, that would be my only one really deciding point. I mean, I, I think it's great, and if we have to be in compliance, but you know, we have policies and rules in place and this should be put out to a public bid. Sure. The, the only thing that I would say to that, and Katie can speak more to it, is there's only so many vendors who actually this, the, and I'm not sure what entity it is that, uh, that decided who the approvals were, but who was on the approval list. So we received the approval list a few months ago. And then what we did is we already had the Zonar system. And so what we did is we added on this component of an already current Zonar system that we have um, so that we can then be compliant with the regulations. Um, so we took a current system and extended it. Um, and so I think when we look at the two variables um, of a current system and then also knowing who from the state was allowed to be that system, um, that's why we chose this system in particular. I, I still find that concerning because there are other vendors and, and I get, but this is kind of when you get hooked in, if you've got one vendor that's just giving you a product and then you're just jumping to them and not truly putting it to the public bid process and going through that process, at least just go through the process <clears throat> is what I'm asking and expecting. So for that, that will have to decide my vote. I did not think of that. Um, can I talk? Yes. I did not think of that, but George is absolutely right. We need to, if for nothing else, it keeps them on their toes. Willie and then Kim, do you have a question or comment? Question I I I'd like to ask is um, there like a urgency timeline that if we um, delayed this and and then asked that you you actually go out to bid and and uh, to bring bring uh, bring back the uh, qualified bidder as long as we're in compliance by the start of the eighteen nineteen school year but the issue that we're running into is um, going to be the timing because. And Dr. Rodriguez started to speak to the process. We waited for all of 2017 for what we were told was going to be an approved list of vendors through the CHP. Um, and right about December 27th, we were told, actually, uh, we're not going to give you a list of vendors that are approved. We're going to give you a list of specifications that are approved. Um, and so now we've got approximately six months 
and all of California is in the same boat. We have 24,000 school buses in California that all have to be compliant in six months. So at this time, we're really just fighting with vendors for them to even come and show us their version of the product versus um, installation. And installation is going to be approximately eight hours per bus. Yeah. And then I have comments, questions. Um, so we already have a system in place. It's called Child Checkmate. Is that right? Or something like it? Zonar is our GPS system and our Z pass for the bus, uh, bus passes. Eight. Um, and Zonar has partnered with Child Checkmate. Okay, that's the extension. Which is the extension of it. And how much are we paying for, how much have we paid out to Zonar? For Child Checkmate? No, or just for the for previous them, system. For the previous system. Because that's new too, right? Yeah, like and that two was years ago. District wide on all of our district vehicles. I don't know what the total cost was on the GPS for the entire district. Well, I guess my point is that we've already made quite an investment in this new system. Um, and so if, if Child Checkmate is the way the add on to the system that already exists that we've invested in, then I'm, I'll support this. Because to go out to vendors, I don't So um, the process of going, of going out to bed, is that, um, is there a, a magic number that says anything over this amount has to go out to open bed? And what would that number be? So generally it is um, 75,000. In which in which we go out to bid I think our, our urgency goes around the fact that we need to make sure that we're in compliance especially us as having the largest fleet in Central California we need to make sure that we're compliant by the first day of school which for us is August right um, and so we need to make sure that we're compliant and that we have the time for them once we get get it that they are able to install it which is eight hours per each bus we have a hundred buses and so we need 800 hours in order to be able to implement this system so literally Katie's been working really quickly on it because we've been waiting 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 and now we need to make sure that we can get these on our buses um, we can go do the bid process and I understand the validity of doing the bid process um, the problem that we have is very similar to some of these other things is we don't want to get ourselves on the end of the list of the vendors because as they're installing they'll install whoever did the bid you know whoever purchased quicker right and so we have when you think about 800 hours um, and someone can only work 40 hours a week then that's um, you know that's 200 um, you know that's 200 um, days so so okay a couple of things if we we are is it ed code that we have to go out to bid for over 75,000 board policy? What, what is it that says that identified that number? Um, it's fairly consistent through the district. So I don't know if it's, I know it was that same amount in Santa Ana. So I'm not sure if it's board policy or, for, or if it's ed code or if it's just common practice. I don't know which one it is. Um, Rich, do you have, do you know that Rich? Do you, do you know if it's by ed code or our own board, board policy? Oh, public contract code. So, so that we be would be code. out of compliance. And I, I'm really worried about that because we can get in big trouble for not going out to bed. Um, we have a, is it? Uh, hold, let, let me finish my thought. Um, would, is there any talk of the state um, entertaining the notion of, um, a, a waiver to extend that time period because I we need to go out to bed if it's there so there was actually a bill to extend the compliance portion of it to the following school year to give um, all of us another year but that uh, senator who brought that bill actually then ended up leaving office under some sexual misconduct allegations and when he did that his bill died and nobody picked it up so no at this point the answer is no okay I was hopeful 
Yeah. But so I understand where we're at and with the timeline and how long it's going to take. I, I don't think there's only going to be one guy doing every one of our buses. I would think they would be doing several at a time, but I'm not comfortable not going out to bid. This is double. And I'm not, I mean, it's, it's up to this board. We, we are supposed to make sure that we remain um, in compliance and within the law when we're dealing with public funds. So I'm not going to support it without a, bi a bid process. Um, but I'm not the only vote here. So if anybody else has comments, we can, you know, put it to vote and see where we're at. Yeah, I have a comment. Uh, uh, do we have a manual um, system now to check to check to see if the see if the um, buses are clear after each run? Yes. So that we have a system in place now. Yes, we have a policy in place now that they are to when they park their bus after their runs. Take their handheld stop sign, walk the rear, walk to the rear of their bus, checking their seats as they go, and placing that stop sign in the rear to indicate that they've done that. Okay, so that we already have a manual system to do that without buying this system. We right? yes, but now there's a new law that requires it to be an automated system. Requires the automation With of the it. electronic text and email so notification. Could we? Could we? Um, could we? Um, use the manual system for our own safety concerns while we're while while we're out to bid and putting these things in long as long as we have a system that is what we're doing. yeah what we're, we're already doing. doing that yeah but now you have two conflicting that's right that's right yeah so 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 that we have a system so that so that we can feel that everyone's safe right so whoever whoever wrote wrote this law must have had a had a thing with the manufacturer here, so that we would have to buy a system. <laughs> well, I hope not. you know, on, honestly, that's so so that we have to we have to purchase a system that's automated, and, and so the problem is that if we go out to bid, so that we should have gone out to bid, we didn't we didn't go out to bid, so that if we delay now and go out to bid, that's going to delay the installation. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. It is still possible to get, put this out to public bid and st still be in compliance come our start date in August. It is possible. You don't know for sure that it's not possible. And we would be upholding a public contract law, which the six of us sitting here are obligated to do. And, you know, even if that has implica implications that we potentially are out of compliance with this other law come the beginning of the 2018-2019 school year, where there may be some foresight on some legislators at the state level to say they put too much of a burden on school districts if one of the largest school districts in the state of California couldn't get into compliance by that date. Right. By following public contract law. So I I'm, you know... I've made my clear my position on this all night, and this is a no vote for me. It's a no-brainer tonight. So um, it, it could be, I mean, the other bids are going to come back more expensive than this one because that means installing all new equipment, right? So we very, may, very well may end up going with this bid, but we have to go through that process. Where our that that's our job. It's one of our most important jobs is to is Absolutely. to watch what we do with public funds. So, um, is there uh, we can just pull the item? I mean, as I'm not sure if we need a motion. I just want to get an idea from the board if the majority here feels like we should pull it. If I have four that want it to go through. Then, if someone would like to make a motion, and if not, then we'll pull it. If there's no motion, I'll pull it. Move to uh, table this item. Second. Second. The table. Okay, we're going to vote. Not Vote to table. Okay, all of those in favor of tabling. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? M motion to table passes six zero one. Thank you. Good discussion. Thank you. Yes, and we. I'm going to ask for a motion to extend the meeting. We have still quite a bit on our 
agenda. So I'm going to ask for 1130. I don't think they're all long. I, I have and just one question before we make that move. Um, just for a point of clarification, are, are the, the board meetings being recorded and televised? Mm -hmm. yes. Since we've moved here, there's been no hiccup with that? They are there all being was. There was one or two meetings that were not recorded just from technical errors. Okay, but they are being recorded and televised. So he's recording, but they are also being televised because it's one thing to be right. Record. They're live okay. streaming. And then when you go on the website under board of directors, you can see links to all of the right. archived. Okay, great. Thank you okay. for the clarification. Okay. Um, 1130. So that was a motion. I'll second that. So all those in favor of extending the board meeting to 1130. Um, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 601. And we are now at um, 10.6, reduction of a, a particular kind of classified employee service for 1819. And this report is, is by Chona Colleen. Uh, yes, President uh, DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, I'm going to go ahead and defer this to Mrs. Pang Pam Shanks, our classified director, of, um, our classified personnel director. Thank you. Hi, Good evening, President DeRose, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. Um, this evening, I am bringing forward um, a reduction of particular kinds of classified employee services for next school year. Um, each year, Human Resources and Finance meet with um, each site and department to go through staffing for the next year. And through that process, there are positions identified that the funding may be ending. Um, the board is given the authority to eliminate positions due to lack of funds. Um, which on Exhibit A, which is attached, are the positions that are going to be eliminated due to lack of funds. Um, this action will allow us to meet with the affected employees and give the 60-day notice that is required by law. Um, we do anticipate um, a few of these positions to be funded next year, but we don't know if they will be until April, and so we need to bring it to the board tonight for action. Um, if the funding is maintained for next year, then we will not need to notify those employees. Um, but we have to notice them 60 days prior to the end of the school year. So in order to do that, we need to have an action taken to eliminate them. But then if we do find funding, we will not be eliminating them. So and are these currently grant funded positions? They're site funded or most of them are like uh, parent um, like parent club funded or site funded monies. And so it's not um, general fund money, it's site money. So that's okay, why. Okay, so it's up to this site's discretion. Correct. On whether to, okay. Um, oh, sorry, do we have speakers? We don't have any for anything else, right? Okay. Okay, um, comments, questions from the board? M my question would be, um, how many employees would we be looking at that we would be letting go through these two positions? So there are two classifications, but within the IA general position, um, classification, there are six different positions because a few of them are two hours, three hours, um, but it's six different people. Six different people, all part-time? Yes, for the IA generals. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned, we do anticipate probably three or four of them to be funded, but we won't know until April whether that's going to happen or not. Okay. Um, so if somebody would like to make a motion and noting that this isn't a pink slip for sure, it's giving you the flexibility right? if needed, if funding doesn't come through. Right. I regretfully will make a motion to lay off these particular classified services and hopeful that we get funding to save these positions. Is there a second? Can I ask a question? Could, when we come Let's back- get a second first sure. and then discussion. And you can make the second if you want. <laughs> no, I will make the second. Um, when we come back in April, for our April meeting, can you update us or administration update us as to what has happened to these six positions so we at least know? I think April may be a little premature. We can do it by May. 
Okay. If we could just have an update sure. as soon as you do know. Maybe sure. I should have said it that way. Thank you. Okay. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes 601, hoping for a positive outcome. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, 10.7 is a certificated job description that is up for um, asking for approval um, for a curriculum coach. And this is also a Ms. Colleen <laughs> report. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, for your consideration is the job description for curriculum coach. Um, we are working with various departments to update a number of job descriptions and better align our, with our district's in, um, academic and um, instructional vision to promote student achievement. Uh, the technology department has a counterpart to this, which is called the innovation coach. And in the past, for ed services, some of these positions were teachers on special assignment. Um, we believe that the upgraded job description better reflects the the great work that the teachers that we have in these positions are doing, um, especially in the area of coaching and mentoring other teachers in content areas. And some of the essential duties, as noted here, would be to provide guidance for standards-based instructional practices, help to develop units of study, create opportunities for teacher collaboration ac across grade levels and sites, facilitate professional development, support um, sites in the analysis of interim and other assessments, and uh, design and develop instructional resources and attend ongoing professional um, development so that they can remain current um, in, in their content areas. Sorry, I just took a sip of water. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so no speakers, questions, comments from the board? Karen? So, um, Unions and everything about this particular position? Uh, this was with um, Susan Perez, spearheaded by Susan Perez from Ed Services. Okay, so but people know about it, including the, the teachers and... We already have a position, like as we indicated, with a technology department. It is the innovation coach. So, oh, this is a classified position? No, no, it is a certificated position. Okay. Right, so it is a certificated with teachers' union, yeah. Um, <coughs> and they know about it, obviously. <laughs> um, we have the position. We just wanted to be consistent because some of them were called TOSAs. Some of them were called coaches. And the work that the, the great work that the teachers in these positions are doing is mostly focus on the coaching and mentoring part of other teachers, especially um, as related to curriculum for this particular position. Okay. And, I, and there's just going to be one person in this position then, right? Oh, I mean, no. It's, uh, it's a variety of, of different positions. Oh, so a lot of people are going to be within this position. We have... We currently have 12 um, teachers. Well, we have 12 positions. Uh, 11 of them are filled. We have six literacy coaches, three math coaches, with one unfilled, one science coach, one assessment coach, and one gate coach that we currently have those positions. The gate oh. coach is not filled either. So those okay. positions currently exist. Okay. So, Karen, some of those positions are called teachers on special assignment yeah, or no, TOSAs, TOSAs, right? TOSAs, so yeah. I think we're just aligning all the different positions, right? making them, making them, uh, putting a job description for them. Okay, great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, and is this um, same pay scale, or is it the same pay scale? It is just um, updated so that we're, we're in better alignment, and especially with our in instructional and academic practices and our vision. Okay. So, um, I'd like to make a motion to accept this uh, new job description. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 601. Thank you. Um, 10.8, um, this was the public hearing on the Sunshine proposal that we did earlier in the meeting. Um, that's where we did our discussion and heard speakers. So um, I can go ahead and call for a vote or a um, motion. 
to approve the sunshine proposal for the 1819. Well, there's no speakers to this one? No. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to accept the sunshine proposal from PVUSD to, to the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers for our multi-year agreement. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes 5-1-1. And 10.9, core SIPs contract. And this is by Dr. Michelle well, Bradley. Yeah. So as you know, one of the main things that we need to focus on is early literacy and ensuring that our students have the foundational skills in order to be able to support the work. So prior to my arrival, there was a direction of moving towards SIPs, um, which um, so SIPs, which stands for Systemic um, Instruction and Phonological Awareness, Phonics, and Sight Words. Um, and so prior to my arrival, that was implemented at the sites. Um, unfortunately, when I was going around the sites, um, because I had just gone through an implementation myself in my previous district, I was able to see that we weren't really adhering to the um, the strategies and the routines within the program. So I was asking the teachers um, what support that they had received um, prior, and the answer was that they really hadn't received um, the support and training in order to implement the program effectively. So many times we talk about it and we know that um, it's not just what you're doing, but how you're doing it. And so we started what we call the reboot with um, three of our schools. So we did start it um, this past year. And I'll ask um, you guys to put up the PowerPoint for me. Um, so we started it in three of our schools with Amesti, Calabasas, and McQuitty. And um, what we have already seen in a very short period of time is we've seen a significant acceleration of our students' literacy abilities. So basically what happens is CORE comes in, they were training um, not only our um, early literacy coordinator, but also our coaches, which were just referenced, to make sure that they knew how to train people. And then they're providing job embedded training and planning with the teachers. So the majority, the grand majority of it is them in the schools with the teachers working on the implementation of this program. And if you look at it here you can see a MESTI. Um, so what you see is you see the difference between what already has happened between the beginning of the year and the middle, the winter screening. Um, what I know personally about it is that our big jump we'll see um, at the end of the school year, not just in the winter. Um, but you'll see that anything that is red is very, very bad, right? Anything that's red um, when you're thinking about first um, when you're thinking about kinder and first grade, is we don't want to be seeing red because that means that the students are not, perf they're not at, um, they're basically not even at a reading level um, to which we can um, count. And so you'll see this is a MESTI. Um, because they, are, they have a bilingual program, you see more lines than others. Um, you will see that, like for instance, Calabasas, they started out with their kinder, and this is one reason why we're doing Paso a Paso, Creciendo Juntos as well, because you can see how the kinder students came in. They came in with 100% of them not reading, and you can see already by winter um, that we have a good percentage of them that are close to where we want them to be. By the end of the year, we know we'll see even a larger percentage, and then you look at their first grade, and you see that really how we have now minimized the number of students that are not where we want them to be. So um, we have a saying that we're gonna, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it well, right? So we actually had a lot of schools that wanted to be part of the first cohort. We didn't allow them to because we needed to build our capacity. Um, so our coaches needed to um, be able to build their capacity. This next year, we are expanding to six additional schools. So we will have nine of our 16 schools that are um, part of this process. Um, that really builds on mastery literacy. Um, and so we, um, we want to, we need the approval of the program so that we can secure, um, 
we can secure Anne Leon. Anne Leon is their top trainer. Um, she, because she was willing to work, she wanted to work with me. I, I did use her in my previous district. Um, she actually gave up another school district in order to be able to come work up here. Um, she hands down, the teachers love her, um, and they find a lot of um, support from her. And so the good part about this is um, she would be providing every single day of the coaching support to the teachers and it sh they go um, they're in the sites multiple days throughout the year so that um, teachers and principals um, receive the support so considering this is our number one um, especially at the elementary level our number one focus is getting kids to be um, literate by third grade we're asking for your support it's expensive though right it's a lot of days so it is expensive, but it is a lot of days of support. And as I had mentioned before, you guys were doing this before I got here and not seeing the results. Well, we're seeing them. With this. Now we are because we're doing the coaching. These are the results that we've been waiting to see yeah. for so long. So, so we would not have, res we can't, we can't, we've proven that we can't do it by ourselves. If not, you guys would have done it prior to my arrival. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, questions, comments from the board? <clears throat> okay. Then. Oh. Yeah. Just a quick comment. Um, I'm in complete support of of this um, contract, this program. Um, this is our one of our um, number one issues that we've been, you know, trying to get a hold of for year after year after year after year. And I I love seeing these types of results. And the more um, staff we can have trained appropriately and and how to get these kids um, moving further along in their achievement, the better. So thank you. Okay. And um, would you like to make a motion, Kim? Yeah, I'll or? make a motion. And second? I'll second. Um, I think this is, um, like I said, this is what we've been needing to see. Reading is the key to everything. Um, so I'm really, really pleased with this, and I'm looking forward to the expansion. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 601. Thank you. Um, next is review for second reading and board action on board policy 4317.13. Sorry, I'm getting tired. Um, this is board policy on management and confidential post-retirement employee benefits. Dr. Rodriguez. So this is the same board policy that we had spoke about before, so it has not changed from its, um, its former state. Again, this is to clarify in writing what the board either approves or does not approve. Um, it solidifies that the fact that retirement means retirement from the school district and from STRS. I mean, STRS. STRS. Okay. Not just re leaving the school district and going to another job. It's exactly. That's not retiring. That is not. Okay. Okay. Um, was the, there any questions, comments, or concerns? <coughs> this is our second reading. I think we went through this pretty thoroughly really asked the you. last time. Willie, do you have a... I have a... I believe you weren't here at that one, right? No. So okay. I'd like to just ask uh, a clarifying sure. question. Mm -hmm. So someone retires at age 55 from, from our school district and is therefore eligible for post-retirement, but if that person goes to work at another school district... Is that person still our responsibility? That's what we're saying. This would put in writing the fact that they're not. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah, because so. in prior years, of course, in prior, prior years, the problem that I had was people retired from our school district at the age of 55, went to work for another school district, and, and was still on our uh, plan of benefits. Yeah. But so that this is going to end yeah. with this. Thank you. Um, I had a clarifying question because something did change from the last time. The last time it said management slash confidential. 
Now it's more specific. It's saying classified management, certificated management, confidential classified personnel. So this is taking, I mean, pretty much all management. So if you're an assistant principal on up, correct? Yeah, I actually, I did not make any changes to it. So this is exactly the PDF. What is attached, the board policy is exactly what we presented prior. The oh, last one, it said management slash confidential. So I was unclear of if this was like two separate categories of groups of people or if it was one specific group, but it, it doesn't matter anyways. It's here, the way it is now, it's saying classified management, certificated management, and confidential classified. So again, that's taking all management. So if you're an assistant principal, all the way on up, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So how many employees are we talking about roughly that that? About 140. And the cost to us, I mean, I, th I think, and in, in, you know, two of my colleagues, you know, mentioned it at our last meeting. Um, Jeff mentioned concerns and where we are within the budget with regards to retirement benefits. I mean, as Kim mentioned, this is like a benefit that people dream of. I mean, this is the Cadillac of Cadillac, I think, if you I, will. Yeah. It's just, I think it's concerning because I don't, what I don't see on this side of it is how this benefits this district. So I think one thing that we talk about is growing our own. So if you are a teacher and you currently get this, you currently get this benefit. So if I am a 50 year old teacher and I am wanting to get an administration, but I know I'm going to retire at 58, 55, whatever it is, I wouldn't then get into management because then I wouldn't get the benefit that I would get if I stayed a teacher. And so as we had said, as I had said before, I'm trying to bring clarity, but also parity to what is currently offered to uh, all other employees. So classified certificated get this as a benefit to them. Um, currently, there has been past practice where, but it's been um, not consistent and it's been inconsistent implementation. So this in writing allows us to know that consistently you get it, but you have to get it. You only get it if you retire from both the district and, um, and STRS. So it could, it could potentially be a cost savings for the district. It gives us better financial oversight. We're not just... Well, yeah, I mean, now at this point... Um, because it's not explicit, um, this whole thing about going to another school district, generally those benefits haven't been pulled. But definitely, if managers don't get this, um, then you are definitely, at, you may be discouraging people to go up, um, grow within the organization, because, I mean, I'm not planning on retiring until I'm 63, but, um, but if someone was, then... They may say, well, I'm going to stay a teacher then because if I become any type of management, then I don't get this benefit. Is this in line with other districts? No, it's not. And I, I never said that it was in line. I'm just trying to have us actually have in writing things that have been in past practice. No, I, I think I really appreciate the fact that that this is it is in writing because then we can have a real honest debate about it. And so I, I think that the transparency is fantastic. So thank you. Um, but you, you know, to George's point, I understand we want to grow our own, and we and we don't want to discourage a fifty-year-old teacher from moving on up because they know the district, they know the people, they know the community. But to me, it feels like this is almost a. Um, we're looking at ways to save money, and we're looking at ways to. Well, not even for the teachers more, but just to have our benefits and our in line with what is being offered ac across the industry. Um, and this, to me, seems like I don't want to say a step backwards, but it seems like it's not going with that. Um, but what I also understand, Michelle, because I can see you, I can see the <laughs> wheels turning. This was past practice. So if we choose not to, really for me it's all about transparency and making sure that people know what they're afforded or not afforded. If we're choosing not to do it, that's not my recommendation, but if we're choosing not to do it, um, then that should be our board policy, that they are not eligible 
for it because currently there is an inconsistent practice that is happening. That's where, that's where we get ourselves in trouble. I, you know, the, where I'm also stuck with this is just the current point of where things are still with the pending negotiations from the 2016-17 school year with PVFT. And I would, what I would really like to see is because this is not a negotiating body group of people. That's correct. So we don't have to set this as policy today. I think settling that matter with PVFT is more prevailing and that we do that and then bring this back after that's done. And, you know, once that's just a resolved matter and decide because this is a group, a body of people that have really ridden off the coattails from what has been negotiated by PVFT in the past practice. That's why we've kind of gotten to this position. So I would really prefer to see that issue resolved because this doesn't have to be decided tonight and just bring this back after that is a resolved matter to this board. Because well, I do. I, I don't get um, hold on, hold on just a minute. Let Michelle answer that, please. So, so I do feel, though, that we need direction from the board with um, current retirements because we do have people that are retiring um, that we need to know the stance on where the board is. So June 30th, we do have administrators retiring. So the question is, is, what is our stance on that? And so, yes, we don't have to do it tonight, right? Um, but um, for some of our administrators, they're retiring, assuming that this is going to go into effect. So we need to have frank conversations with those people because some people are retiring prior to 65 and believe that they are going to be getting these benefits. How many would you say out of that? What did you say, 104? No, we have about 140. So I'm sorry. we have, a, I think, that are five, four or five um, that are retiring this year. But, but so, being consistent, we need to make sure that we inform them now because that might alter their decision, right? So could you please clarify, because I think there's some confusion. We're not implementing this new handout. That's not what we're doing. This is already policy. Well, it's, it's past practice, yes. Past practice, not policy. Right, right. But the way it was done before is um, if someone was leaving here, we were, <coughs> we, with past practice, we were not being good stewards of the taxpayer money. This tightens it up, so they still get the benefit however they have to actually retire from PERS and I want to get away from saying management doesn't deserve things because I keep hearing that and management works just as hard as any other employee and I value every employee in this district and I don't think it's fair to say they're riding on the coattails they don't deserve things you know I just I I don't agree with that that's my personal opinion. And I think that we should, we should pass this so everybody is clear on what is available to them and it's not handed out one way to one person and another way to another person. We need to be consistent and that's, that's our job is to have clear and consistent board policy. Anybody else? Willie? I, I also think that the um, that it, that it's got to be consistent, and I think, and I and I thought this was for everyone, not just the management people, and and I and I think that uh, think that I'd like to see this policy extended to everyone because what we offered before, when we were trying to get people to retire, was the uh, was the um, handshake. handshake thing at age fifty five, and so. So the uh, management group is a very small number compa financially compared to everyone within the school district. And, and, and I think that we should have the same policy for everybody. And, and I also think that we need to phase it in so that if we pass this this year, it, it doesn't pertain to the people that are going to retire this year 
but start to enforce it the following year? Well, we, we, would, in, we would enforce whatever board policy immediately. Um, so right now, the, the past practice has been if you're a management and you're within the 55 to 65, um, then you would get it just as would all certificated and classified employees. The, the caveat, as um, Leslie was mentioning, was this specifies specifically that you have to be not, you have to be retired. You can't now go and go someplace else, which... It, it, or, or only management level so, people. So this policy is only for management. It's already in the contracts for classified and certificated. It's already in the contracts. It's already in their contracts. So that way we're consistent. And now we're trying to establish board policy because it was silent on there, which led to inconsistent application of that policy. Um, it's already in their contracts. It's in the other two contracts, yes. Okay. Right. Uh, I, oh, sorry. To me, the most important thing here is consistency. I, I, I think that as a, as, a, um, as a district, we've been very rich with some of our benefits. I, I know for a fact that people don't enjoy them on the, um, in the private sector, but, I, but we do need to be consistent. And so if we're, if we're giving this out to some people and not others, it becomes a popularity contest. If we have a, a, firm, a firm, consistent policy, we can change it. And move it as as we move forward because again I th and I think we're going to have to eventually, um, but we have to be consistent. And if we're doing this past practice, let's get it in black and white, and that's when you start <coughs> to have the discussion. I I'm not comfortable with it in terms of what we're giving out, but I am comfortable that we're being consistent and fair to everybody, and that's where you have to start. So, uh, Jeff, if I may, what? What what's your solution to the people that are going to retire this year? I think if it's been pra my personal opinion, I think if it's been past practice. They're probably assuming it's going to happen, and we need to be, we need to treat those people with what we've been doing in past practice. The problem for me is is that we didn't look at this five years ago and say this is the policy. Instead, it was well, we're going to do this, or you know, yeah, we did it for you know, for uh, manager B, so yeah, I guess we'll do it for manager C. No, we need to be black and white. That's, that way we treat everybody fairly. That's, that's honestly how you value employees, is you treat everybody fairly, in my opinion, my humble opinion. So. Are you? No, so, so um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just trying to figure out what you were saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're, I think that we have been, and maybe I'm not being clear, it's 11. I, no, you would, uh, I'm in support of it because we need to be consistent. You, would, wait, wait, let, you would support the people that are going to retire this year to be under past practices? Yes, because we can't now say, well. You can't change it right now. Right. But, but if we do change it to, to match other employees in the school district, the, you know, the union contracts and such, then you're okay with going forward with that. This actually does change it to match the union contracts, Willie. This changes the policy to match the union contract. This is the contract this that is everyone contract. else gets. So, so would you be okay to, to honor our past practices for the employees that are retiring this year? No. 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 Yeah. Let Michelle clarify that, please. Okay. So... This, what this does, and it would be from this, this moment forward, is you would not receive this benefit if you were not retiring full time. Meaning, if you were going to another school district, you would not get it. You would not get it this year. You would not get it next year. You have to retire. In, this in the certificated contract, it specifically states that you must retire from STRS. In the classified contract, it d it's silent. And that's where the, that is where the, the inconsistencies came, right? So we're putting in So we are putting in the consistencies. Hers. Every employee manager employee that I know that is retiring this year is retiring retiring from PERS. from PERS. from STRS 
Uh, yes. Start, okay. So if they're under 65, if they're not Medicare age, this district will pay their benefits for them and their spouse until they reach Medicare age. So for if they're retiring at 57, then we're going to continue to pay for them and their spouse all the way until they're 65. The teachers get that, and we're making it very explicit now that all the all the managers are going to get that. Uh, Where we were having problems is that people were taking advantage of us. They were leaving the district, telling us they were retiring, but then taking a job over the hill, making a very high salary while Pajaro was on the hook for paying but, their benefits. But so were the other teachers and no. classified. No. They couldn't. They would know. They they, if the teachers did that, they would know because then they would be contributing back into their First. retirement First. again, and then. But would, but I thought they that's what maybe that was a meeting that I missed that you changed this. Yeah. No. I. No, this is just making explicit. It was already in the contract for certificated staff. Oh, so that they had to both retire from the district and STRS. So, so obviously, in <coughs> order to get the classified to do exactly what we're saying that we want to do with the managers, we have to negotiate the fact that they can't just leave the district when they retire and go someplace else, the classified. At this point, classified workers can do that, right? Classified uh, retirees can retire from this district, go to another district, and continue to get their benefits until there's continue to get their benefits, right? Classify can do that. Well, right now it's silent. So I would say that they technically could. It does say retirement. So for me, retirement means you retire, not that you relocate. Um, but technically it's, it's not explicit in the classified contract. We cannot arbitrarily change the classified contract. Yeah, that's the bummer about it. <laughs> we can't. We, we cannot. So that it's, uh, yeah. I mean, it is a negotiable item. Yes. Negotiable to get them to say that, oh, yeah, we agree with you. They shouldn't be able to go off and do whatever they want. But they, they, th they probably think their contract kind of states that, but not totally. <laughs> okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve this uh, policy. Okay. A second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes 5-1-1. So that was it on our action items. Oh, not everybody fall. Are you awake over there? I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, Victor. We um, are at 11.1. .1. This is a report uh, update on our Measure L bond, Prop 98, and Prop 39 construction projects throughout the district. Thank you. I'm sorry it's late. You can you can go quickly, but you know make Sounds sure good. we get the good stuff. Okay, I will. Um, as a matter of fact, if I go just too fast, uh, just go ahead and stop me. Okay. So um, we're going to be going over the construction projects. Uh, district wide. So uh, let's see. Just press the worn out button, right? <laughs> All right. So on the agenda, we want to go over some of the expenditures that we've done. And also, we want to describe some of the funding that has been used in the expenditures. So Measure L bond, Prop 39, Prop 98. Um, also, along with that, we want to go ahead and cover what we've been doing from the winter, the spring, and what is it being expected or bleeding into the summer projects. And of course, a small little blurb of an update of the PV High School um, uh, field and auditorium. Uh, so back in 2020, 2012 and 2015, we roughly spent about $26.1 million. In 2015, 16, about 14.9. 16 and 17, we introduced the Prop 98 and the Prop 39. Uh, so basically what we did is used roughly about 17.7 million of the Measure L, 2.6 on the Prop 98, and the about 821,000 on Prop 39. In 2018, of course, this is projected. This is also bleeding into the summer. Measure L bond, we're looking at doing about $18.1 million. Prop 98, 2.49, and Prop 39, 3.4. 
So just breaking those projects down in 2016 and 2017, we did exterior and interior lighting as part of Prop 39 and furnace replacements in Cesar Chavez and Watsonville High School. Uh, Prop 98 in 2016 and 2017, we did two major roof projects, which you voted on, and that was the Rolling Hills and the Paro Middle School. In 2017-18, Prop 98, um, we are replacing or modernizing two restrooms at two of the high schools. And we're also doing um, the science classrooms at three of the high schools. So at, at all three high schools. I'm sorry, not three at the high schools, but we're not. Anyways, um, and then we also uh, had you guys vote on the Alianza Wixa sanitary sewer upgrades and the bird deterrent. And by the way, it's working well. Um, so winter spring projects. Now these are the small projects that we could actually fit in during the winter time, and some of the some of the ones that could bleed into so over the uh, spring break, and some of these will be redundant in the later portion of the presentation. And I'll I'll go ahead and skip over those. Um, so Alianza Charter School, uh, did, we did some uh, removal of. Uh, portable uh, buildings, restroom modernization, and some asphalt installation. Aptos High School, of course, uh, we had to do some uh, temporary shoring for the heavily damaged dry rot that we have. Uh, Calabasas Elementary School had some site improvements with ADA walkways, and we're also doing in-house a play field restoration and track installation. Uh, Cesar Chavez, there's an energy management system that was installed, and we're still continuing to install it. Um, Hall District Elementary Installation New Track and Field, Minty White Asphalt Improvements, uh, Paro Valley High Bird Deterrent again, that was a repetition from the previous Transportation Yard Bioswale, and we're also going to have to do some, uh, uh, probably some roof improvements there too. Uh, Watsonville Child Care, we did some fencing, and then also uh, Watsonville Charge School of the Arts, again, uh, the um, sanitary sewer system. Um, Upcoming summit projects now, these are, these are the big ones that really are just focused for the summer. Ohlone Elementary, of course, we have uh, the roofing improvements that, uh, uh, that are happening now and are bleeding into the summer and the exterior painting of the entire campus. Radcliffe Elementary, we're doing a safety perimeter fencing in the front solely because of the problems of what we were having uh, with the homeless. Watsonville High School. Uh, again, we're doing heating, ventilation, and improvements, and we're also doing a, um, a livestock uh, barn for the Future Farmers of America, or the FFA building, uh, um, program. Um, Alianza, again, upcoming uh, central zone. Uh, Alianza, we, 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 we did talk about the sanitary sewer and the leach fields. Uh, Mesty, we're doing some perimeter safety fencing, drop bus, bus drop-off, and front of its improvements for... Um, for kids. Uh, Rolling Hills, we're doing the exterior uh, painting and dry rot repair. As you know, one of the major projects that we, that we did at Rolling Hills was the roof uh, repair. So now we're just kind of uh, going down the line and, and trying to complete that project. Starlight, uh, there's a much needed fire alarm upgrade. Cesar Chavez, again, the heating ventilation. Uh, Aptos Junior High School, uh, this is pretty, pretty cool because um, we did have some hiccups early on with uh, PG&E, but it seems like we're being, we're being able to uh, get over those, those hurdles. So Aptos Junior High School, we're replacing nine portable classrooms. At uh, Aptos High, again, the two uh, restroom modernizations. Valencia, we're replacing six portables, and Bradley, we're replacing five portable classrooms there. So update on PV High. The update, um, as you know, we, we did uh, submit to DSA plans. We're, we've been approved by DSA. We also uh, submitted our coastal development permit uh, in December 8th of 2017. And now we're working, working closely with the city and they're kind of been uh, a guiding light for us for uh, what we should be submitting for the CDP in order to present it to the uh, Planning Commission and minimize the questions or the, or the concerns of the Planning Commission. Uh, Paro Valley uh, School project update on the auditorium portion of it. Uh, 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 DSA plans have been approved. The district and um, the Caltrans Aeronautics, along with the Pilot Association, reached an agreement. The coast Devel development permit was submitted on uh, November 22 of 2016, and uh, the city did uh, have 
have it approved, however, submitted it to the Coastal Commission with an unfavorable uh, recommendation. So right now we're still kind of sitting on that one because it is part of the agreement that uh, we settled with the Wat uh, Watsonville Pilots Association. So right now uh, the city or the, the Coastal uh, Commission is asking for more information on that. And that kind of concludes my presentation. I hope I was too fast. So fast, but good information. Thank you. Um, no speakers, right? Um, questions, comments from the board? I'll just make a note of a comment to you. Um, Say, I tell Victor um, in private all the time, but I just in, in public wanted to thank him and his team for all the incredible work that they're doing. When you look at um, all of the projects that they've done in the last two years versus what was done in even a five-year span prior to that, um, they've really been working hard. So they're not just doing projects during the summer, but they're doing it during the winter and the spring and really trying to make sure that our schools are safer and better um, for our students and our staff. So I know we work you hard, but we really appreciate it and all the work that your team does. So thanks, Victor. I love what I do. Thank you. Yep. Victor, the, the uh, PV, uh, PV High Auditorium. Give him your voice. On the, on the uh, last, on the Back previous there. screen, down on the, the application was, was approved by City Council on February, um, but uh, failed to receive a positive staff recommendation. So, so has uh, that been overcome or what's, what's the, um, where I, are we? I think the real focus right now is trying to get the uh, play fields going. So our focus has been really kind of engineering that portion of it right now. I think uh, because of our agreement with the Pilots Association, they uh, have allowed us to go ahead and do the play fields first and then tackle the auditorium at a later date. But Okay, so... I, I think that we had talked about coming to the city council soon. Is that? Yeah, supposedly we're gonna. There's gonna be a hearing. And we're gonna get. Hold on, Karen. Let Michelle answer that. Yeah. Please. So if he goes back one slide, um, so it says proposed date here, but we know that it's actually been posted, so it's no longer proposed, but it's the date. So on the April third, it will will it will go for towards the planning commission, and then um, we're assuming a positive staff recommendation at the April tenth. City Council. So as our agreement with the pilot states, we're working in phase one. So we're extremely focused on phase one at this point. Once we get that done, we will go to phase two, but we need to get phase one done first, and then we'll, we'll step aside. I think for us, um, it's really important that we remain focused on one project at a time. I'm just happy that we're able to resolve at least this problem, and then we'll move on to the next. Thank you for the for the record, uh, Leslie. I, I I would like to just uh, commend the superintendent and Victor and everybody for really working on this and getting this thing through. It, you, you guys have done well. Thank you very much. And and uh, and and it's been um, not a miracle, but it's been almost miraculous. miraculous. And mir almost, almost miraculous. miraculous <laughs> I guess. Almost care. miraculous. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Victor. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Thank you. Okay. So, Kim, and then we really need to move forward because we still have to do a uh, consent agenda and um, closed session items, which are action items. 
and we have to be done by 11.30. So go ahead, Kim. Um, just on PV High, I'd like to make sure that we disseminate whatever information we can to the school and to the students who have been very, very patient and also very angry that this hasn't moved forward. And we know because um, behind closed doors, we talk about these projects all the time. So we've had updates, but uh, the general public couldn't have them just yet until some of these things got worked out. And so just communication and transparency is important. So um, I'd like to talk about Aptos for a minute. So at Valencia, there's only like one or two toilets for the entire male population at that school. Is that going to be fixed? Yeah. Okay, like so toilet with a stall. Sit down toilets for boys. There's like two in the whole school. I, I think there might be more, but I, I can do a, a CPC study, which is uh, – uh, toilet and uh, facilities count for the amount of students. So there's a code that goes along with it. I could have that done uh, for you and send it to you. Okay, because that's a complaint that I get routinely, that there's not enough toilets for the amount of boys at that school. Yeah, and a lot of the sites do have that same complaint solely because the code doesn't really um, decipher how many girls and how many boys. It's always cut in the middle, whoever, whatever the ADA is. And unfortunately, there's always longer lines for the girls and right. shorter lines but for I the boys. But I see it's on your list to redo the bathrooms there. Um, so what's so happening there, th by the this way? This wasn't really on our list, oh. but it was kind of forced upon us by uh, Division of State Architects. So in order to do the replacement of the portables, they want those two bathrooms upgraded, even though there's two more other bathrooms at the end of the administration building that could use the same, the same attention. Because I know we spent a bunch of money replacing all the toilets in there to super low flow, right? Yes. Just like not long ago, three years ago. So, so the, the most costly um, elements in a building are either the restrooms or the kitchen. And that goes for almost every, everything. A classroom is a little bit less, but yeah, they're very costly. Okay. And then up at Aptos High, I know we've been trying to get the bathrooms replaced for many years. That's been a huge complaint over and over from students and parents. Yeah. So What's the plan? The... The status on that one is that we went to DSA and they found some discrepancies. Of course, DSA is God, and they, they are so also making us do some ADA handicap walkway modifications. So that's been at DSA, but we're ready to uh, go. It's out to bid, and once it we, we see the bid, we're going to go ahead and start closing down Building J and do that that restroom first, and then phase it into the second, which is Building I. So those are the two uh, buildings that are getting the full modernization. They're, they're the biggest restrooms, too. Okay. And is there any plan to to upgrade the bathroom and the administration building? There's, like, no fan in there. It's just... Right. Now, was a, the focus was just, I mean, what, what we did um, address was the student ADA bathrooms. Yeah, okay. And those, and for the budget that was given to us, and you voted on that, and so we had to kind of tailor the scope of work to the amount of money that that was available so in regard to the dry rot which is um plentiful on that campus not just in the area that was shored up but in many spots like what is the plan for that and how are we going to pay for it as a matter of fact uh the third issuance gave the site six million dollars and that's where it's going to be paid by uh it's also going to address the roof of course so are we so, redoing all the roofs there yes yeah yes so our goal is to started okay so we do have engineers on site and uh, we just had a meeting as a matter of fact yesterday and we talked about how we can phase it in and get it done as quickly as possible so we're going to go ahead and segregate the lower portion of the dry rot so that we could address it and uh, probably talk to the site and coordinate that portion of it see if it's available or possible uh, as far as interruptions go uh, and then once next year comes in 2019 we can start addressing the roof and the dry rot at the roof uh, membrane great so nine portables at aptos junior high any plan for the field at all the fields the which one so we aptos, at, junior. aptos high we have the lower field which is the freedom field she's Ap talking about junior. aptos junior high aptos junior high i'm sorry at aptos junior high uh lower field let me i'm sorry that's okay Drying you can get back to me Okay. If there isn't a so, plan, I'd like Wharf to Wharf to help with the with the track and field there. The the track and field, we don't have anything uh, assigned, anything any kind of scope on onto that. Um, yeah, if we can get Wharf to Wharf, uh, they can rejuvenate the the track. Uh, 
but we also have uh, uh, some issues with some MOUs because the baseball is actually the best. Uh, I don't know if it's a little league or not. We need to clean that up on the okay. portions of what well, we need to move forward. Um, very quickly, Karen, and then we're going to ask that. you. Um, d students are going to know about the 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 city council meeting um, next. Um, uh, April 10th, right? The students they're, are gonna know. They're already aware. We, okay. we told her the day that it came out. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Victor. Thank you. Good job. I know. Yeah, good job. You were really pushed and you came through. Okay. Um, consent agenda is item 12. Do I have a motion to approve? I make a motion. Any second? Second. I'll second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 6-0-1. No, no deferred items. Closed session. And Karen, can you read out on expulsions, please? I and move. then Kim is going to do the remainder. I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a full expulsion for the remainder of 2017-2018 school year for 17-18-029. Karen. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 6-0-1. I mo move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of 2017-2018 school year for 17-18-030. Is there a second? All second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 601. I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a full expulsion for the remainder of 2017 2018 school year and fall semester of the 2018 2019 school year for 17 18 032. All second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 601. Kim? Thank you, Karen. Um, this is, is your mic on? I'm oh, sorry. I move to approve the certificated report as presented by administration with the following additions one administrative appointment, one teacher appointment, and nine separations. A second, please. All second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I abstain. Oops. We're not there for that. Who was that? Me. I'm abstaining from okay. that vote. Okay. Um, five, 5011. Kim is abstaining. Okay. Uh, for classified, I, I move to approve the classified employee report with the following additions. One, food and nutrition services assistant. Under miscellaneous action, five instructional assistants, one behavior technician, one administrative secretary, three, one child welfare and attendance analyst, and one staff accountant under leaves of absence, and two instructional assistants and one behavior technician under separating from service. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 601. Is that it? That is it. Okay, perfect. Upcoming board meetings, um, April 11th, we'll be doing a special board study session on student outcomes, um, data, fun, fun data. But um, that meeting will be held in the HR conference room at the district office. And then the meeting following that, April 25th, will return here to the city council chambers. And if you'd like to come a few minutes early, there's going to be a student art show um, in the government offices here. So we encourage you to come and see our student work. Thank you very much, and we're adjourned. <laughs>